Section 1 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmary Shea. April 1st, St. Hugh, Bishop. It was the happiness of this saint to receive from his cradle the strongest impressions of piety by the example and care of his illustrious and holy parents. He was born at Chateau Neuf, in the territory of Valence, in Dauphiné, in 1053. His father, Odilo, who served his country in an honorable post in the army, labored by all the means in his power to make his soldiers faithful servants of their creator, and by severe punishments to restrain vice. By the advice of his son, St. Hugh, he afterwards became a Carthusian monk, and died at the age of a hundred, having received extreme unction and viaticum from the hands of his son. Our saint likewise assisted, in her last moments, his mother, who had for many years, under his direction, served God in her own house by prayer, fasting, and plenteous alms deeds. Hugh, from the cradle, appeared to be a child of benediction. He went through his studies with great applause, and having chosen to serve God in an ecclesiastical state, he accepted a canonry in the cathedral of Valence. His great sanctity and learning rendered him an ornament of that church, and he was finally made bishop of Grenoble. He set himself at once to reprove vice and to reform abuses, and so plentiful was the benediction of heaven upon his labors, that he had the comfort to see the face of his diocese in a short time exceedingly changed. After two years he privately resigned his bishopric, presuming on the tacit consent of the Holy See, and, putting on the habit of St. Bennet, he entered upon a novitiate in the austere abbey of Casa Dei in Auvergne. There he lived a year, a perfect model of all the virtues to that house of saints, till Pope Gregory the Seventh commanded him, in virtue of holy obedience, to resume his pastoral charge. He earnestly solicited Pope Innocent the Second for leave to resign his bishopric, that he might die in solitude, but was never able to obtain his request. God was pleased to purify his soul by a lingering illness before he called him to himself. Some time before his death, he lost his memory for everything but his prayers. He closed his penitential course on the 1st of April in 1132, wanting only two months of being eighty years old, of which he had been fifty-two years bishop. Miracles attested the sanctity of his happy death, and he was canonized by Innocent II in 1134. Reflection. Let us learn from the example of the saints to shun the tumult of the world as much as our circumstances will allow, and give ourselves up to the exercises of holy solitude, prayer, and pious reading. End of section 1. Section 2 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April, June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Mayer. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April, June. By John Gilmary Shea. April 2nd, St. Francis of Paula. At the age of fifteen, Francis left his poor home at Paula in Calabria to live as a hermit in a cave by the sea coast. In time, disciples gathered round him, and with them, in 1436, he founded the Minims, so called to show that they were the least of monastic orders. They observed a perpetual Lent and never touched meat, fish, eggs, or milk. Francis himself made the rock his bed. His best garment was a hair shirt, and boiled herbs his only fare. As his body withered, his faith grew powerful, 
and he did all things in him who strengthened him. He cured the sick, raised the dead, averted plagues, expelled evil spirits, and brought sinners to penance. A famous preacher, instigated by a few misguided monks, set to work to preach against St. Francis and his miracles. The saint took no notice of it, and the preacher, finding that he made no way with his hearers, determined to see this poor hermit and confound him in person. The saint received him kindly, gave him a seat by the fire, and listened to a long exposition of his own frauds. He then quietly took some glowing embers from the fire, and closing his hands upon them unhurt, said, Come, Father Anthony, warm yourself, for you are shivering, for want of a little charity. Father Anthony, falling at the saint's feet, asked for pardon, and then, having received his embrace, quitted him to become his panegyrist and attain himself to great perfection. When the avaricious King Ferdinand of Naples offered him money for his convent, Francis told him to give it back to his oppressed subjects, and softened his heart by causing blood to flow from the ill-gotten coin. Louis XI of France, trembling at the approach of death, sent for the poor hermit to ward off the foe whose advance neither his fortresses nor his guards could check. Francis went by the Pope's command and prepared the king for a holy death. The successors of Louis showered favors on the saint. His order spread throughout Europe, and his name was reverenced through the Christian world. He died at the age of 91 on Good Friday, 1507. With the crucifix in his hand and the last words of Jesus on his lips, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Reflection Rely in all difficulties upon God. That which enabled St. Francis to work miracles will in proportion do wonders for yourself by giving you strength and consolation. End of section 2Section 3 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Mayer. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April, June, by John Gilmary Shea. April 3rd, St. Richard of Chichester. Richard was born A.D. 1197 in the little town of Weish, eight miles from Worcester, England. He and his elder brother were left orphans when young, and Richard gave up the studies which he loved to farm his brother's impoverished estate. His brother, in gratitude for Richard's successful care, proposed to make over to him all his lands, but he refused both the estates and the offer of a brilliant marriage to study for the priesthood at Oxford. In 1235 he was appointed, for his learning and piety, Chancellor of that university, and afterwards, by St. Edmund of Canterbury, Chancellor of his diocese. He stood by that saint in his long contest with the king, and accompanied him into exile. After St. Edmund's death, Richard returned to England to toil as a simple curate, but was soon elected Bishop of Chichester in preference to the worthless nominee of Henry III. The king, in revenge, refused to recognize the election, and seized the revenues of the see. Thus Richard found himself fighting the same battle in which St. Edmund had died. He went to Lyon, was there consecrated by Innocent IV in 1245, and returning to England, in spite of his poverty and the king's hostility, exercised fully his episcopal rights, and thoroughly reformed his see. After two years, his revenues were restored. Young and old loved St. Richard. He gave all he had. He worked miracles to feed the poor and heal the sick. But when the rights or purity of the church were concerned, he was inexorable. A priest of noble blood polluted his office by sin. Richard deprived him of his benefice and refused the king's petition in his favor. On the other hand, when a knight violently put a priest in prison, Richard compelled the knight to walk round the priest's church with the same log of wood on his neck to which he had chained the priest. And when the Burgesses of Luz tore a criminal from the church and hanged him, Richard made them dig up the body from its unconsecrated grave and bear it back to the sanctuary they had violated. 
Richard died A.D. 1253 while preaching at the Pope's command a crusade against the Saracens. Reflection. As a brother, as chancellor, and as bishop, St. Richard faithfully performed each duty of his state without a thought of his own interests. Neglect of duty is the first sign of that self-love which ends with the loss of grace. End of section 3「Section 4 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmary Shea. April 4, St. Isidore, Archbishop. Isidore was born of a ducal family at Carthagena in Spain. His two brothers, Leander, Archbishop of Seville, Fulgentius, Bishop of Egia, and his sister, Florentina, are saints. As a boy he despaired at his ill success in study and ran away from school. Resting in his flight at a roadside spring, he observed a stone which was hollowed out by the dripping water. This decided him to return, and by hard application he succeeded where he had failed. He went back to his master, and with the help of God became, even as a youth, one of the most learned men of the time. He assisted in converting Prince Ricard, the leader of the Arian party, and with his aid, though at the constant peril of his own life, he expelled that heresy from Spain. Then, following a call from God, he turned a deaf ear to the entreaties of his friends and embraced a hermit's life. Prince Ricard and many of the nobles and clergy of Seville went to persuade him to come forth and represented the needs of the times and the good he could do and had already done among the people. He refused, and as far as we can judge, that refusal gave him the necessary opportunity of acquiring the virtue and the power which afterwards made him an illustrious bishop and doctor of the church. On the death of his brother Leander he was called to fill the vacant see. As a teacher, ruler, founder, and reformer, he labored not only in his own diocese but throughout Spain and even in foreign countries. He died in Seville on April 4, 636, and within sixteen years of his death was declared a doctor of the Catholic Church. Reflection The strength of temptation usually lies in the fact that its object is something flattering to our pride, soothing to our sloth, or in some way attractive to the meaner passions. St. Isidore teaches us to listen neither to the promptings of nature nor the plausible advice of friends when they contradict the voice of God. End of section 4. St. Isidore. Section 5 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints. Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea. April 5th, St. Vincent Ferrer. This wonderful apostle, the Angel of the Judgment, was born at Valencia in Spain in 1350, and at the age of 18 professed in the Order of St. Dominic. After a brilliant course of study, he became master of sacred theology. For three years he read only the scriptures, and knew the whole Bible by heart. He converted the Jews of Valencia, and their synagogue became a church. Grief at the great schism then afflicting the church reduced him to the point of death. But our Lord himself in glory bade him go forth to convert sinners, for my judgment is nigh. This miraculous apostolate lasted twenty-one years. He preached throughout Europe in the towns and villages of Spain, Switzerland, France, Italy, England, Ireland, Scotland. Everywhere tens of thousands of sinners were reformed. Jews, infidels, and heretics were converted. Stupendous miracles enforced his words. Twice each day the miracle bell summoned the sick, the blind, the lame to be cured. 
sinners the most obdurate became saints speaking only his native spanish he was understood in all tongues processions of ten thousand penitents followed him in perfect order convents orphanages hospitals arose in his path amidst all his humility remained profound his prayer constant he always prepared for preaching by prayer once however when a person of high rank was to be present at his sermon he neglected prayer for study the nobleman was not particularly struck by the discourse which had been thus carefully worked up but coming again to hear the saint unknown to the latter the second sermon made a deep impression on his soul when st vincent heard of the difference he remarked that in the first sermon it was vincent who had preached but in the second jesus christ he fell ill at vannes in brittany and received the crown of everlasting glory in fourteen nineteen reflection whatever you do says st vincent think not of yourself but of god in this spirit he preached and god spoke by him in this spirit if we listen we shall hear the voice of god End of section 5section six of little victoria lives of the saints volume two april through june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org little victoria lives of the saints volume two april through june by john gilmary shea april six saint celestine pope saint celestine was a native of rome and upon the demise of pope boniface he was chosen to secede him in september four twenty two by the wonderful consent of the whole city his first official act was to confirm the condemnation of an african bishop who had been convicted of grave crimes he wrote also to the bishops of the provinces of vienne and narbonne in gaul to correct several abuses and ordered among other things that absolution or reconciliation should never be refused to any dying sinner who sincerely asked it for repentance depends not so much on time as on the heart he assembled a synod in rome in four thirty in which the writings of nestorius were examined and his blasphemies in maintaining christ a divine and a human person were condemned the pope pronounced sentence of excommunication against nestorius and deposed him be informed that agricola the son of a british bishop called severianus who had been married before he was raised to the priesthood had spread the seeds of the pelagian heresy in britain saint celestine sent thither saint germanus of auxerre whose zeal and conduct happily prevented the threatening danger he also sent saint palatius a roman to preach the faith to the scots both in north britain and in ireland and many authors of the life of st patrick say that apostle likewise received his commission to preach to the irish from st celestine in four thirty one this holy pope died on the first of august in four thirty two having reigned almost ten years reflection vigilance is truly needful to those to whom the care of souls has been confided blessed are the servants whom the lord at his coming shall find watching End of section six. Section seven of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume Two, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laurie Arsenault Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea April 7th, St. Hegesippus, a Primitive Father, and Blessed Herman Joseph of Steinfeld He was by birth a Jew, and belonged to the church of Jerusalem. But traveling to Rome, he lived there nearly twenty years, from the pontificate of Anicetus to that of Eleutherius in 177, 
when he returned into the east, where he died at an advanced age, probably at Jerusalem, in the year of Christ 180, according to the Chronicle of Alexandria. He wrote in the year 133 a history of the church in five books, from the Passion of Christ down to his own time, the loss of which work is extremely regretted. In it he gave illustrious proofs of his faith, and showed the apostolical tradition, and that though certain men had disturbed the church by broaching heresies, yet down to his time no episcopal see or particular church had fallen into error. This testimony he gave, after having personally visited all the principal churches, both of the East and the West. Blessed Hermann Joseph of Steinfeld Hermann, from his earliest years, was a devoted client of the Mother of God. As a little child he used to spend all his playtime in the church at Cologne, before an image of Mary, where he received many favors. One bitter winter day, as little Herman was coming barefooted into church, his heavenly mother appeared to him, asked him lovingly why his feet were bare in such cold weather. Alas, dear lady, he said, it is because my parents are so poor. She pointed to a stone, telling him to look beneath it. There he found four silver pieces wherewith to buy shoes. He did not forget to return and thank her. She enjoined him to go to the same spot in all his wants, and disappeared. Never did the supply fail him, but his comrades, moved by a different spirit, could find nothing. Once Our Lady stretched out her hand and took an apple which the boy offered her in pledge of his love. Another time, he saw her high up in the tribune with the Holy Child and St. John. He longed to join them, but saw no way of doing so. Suddenly he found himself placed by their side and holding sweet converse with the infant Jesus. At the age of twelve he entered the Premonstratensian house at Stenfeld and there led an angelic life of purity and prayer. His fellow novices, seeing what graces he received from Mary, called him Joseph, and when he shrank from so high an honor, Our Lady in a vision took him as her spouse and bade him bear the name. Jealously she reproved the smallest faults in her betrothed, and once appeared to him as an old woman to upbraid him for some slight want of devotion. As her dowry, she conferred on him the most cruel sufferings of mind and body, which were especially severe on the great feasts of the church. But with the cross, Mary brought him the grace to bear it bravely, and thus his heart was weaned from earthly things, and he was made ready for his earthly and saintly death, which took place about the year 1230. Reflection do not approach our Blessed Mother with set prayers only. Be intimate with her. Confide in her. Commend to her every want and every project, small as well as great. It is a childlike reliance and a trustful appeal which she delights to reward. End of Section 7 Recording by Laurie Arsenault Section 8 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints Volume 2, April, June This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Bryan Stewart Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April, June, by John Gilmary Shear April 8th, St. Perpetuus, 
bishop. St. Perpetuus was the eighth bishop of Tours from St. Gatian, and governed that see above thirty years, from 461 to 491, when he died on the 8th of April. During all that time, he laboured by zealous sermons, many synods, and wholesome regulations to lead souls to virtue. St. Perpetuus had a great veneration for the saints, and respect for their relics, adorned their shrines, and enriched their churches. As there was a continual succession of miracles at the tomb of St. Martin, Perpetuus, finding the church built by St. Bricus too small for the concourse of people that resorted hither, directed its enlargement. When the building was finished, the good bishop solemnized the dedication of this new church, and performed the translation of the body of St. Martin, on the 4th of July in 473. Our saint made and signed his last will, which is still extant, on the 1st of March, 475, fifteen years before his death. By it he remits all debts that were owing to him, and having bequeathed to his church his library and several farms, and settled a fund for the maintenance of lamps, and the purchase of sacred vessels as occasion might require, he declares to poor his ears. He adds most pathetic exhortations to concord and piety, and bequeaths to his sister, Fidia Julia Perpetua, a little gold cross with relics. He leaves legacies to several other friends and priests, begging of each a remembrance of him in their prayers. His ancient epitaph equals him to the great St. Martin. Reflection The smart of poverty, says a spiritual writer, is allayed even more by one word of true sympathy than by the alms we give. Alms coldly and harshly given irritate rather than soothe. Even when we cannot give, words of kindness are as a precious balm. And when we can give, they are the salt and seasoning of our alms. End of section 8section 9 of little pictorial lives of the saints volume 2 april to june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org little pictorial lives of the saints volume 2 april to june by john gilmari shea april 9 saint mary of egypt and saint john the almoner at the tender age of twelve, Mary left her father's house, that she might sin without restraint, and for seventeen years she lived in shame at Alexandria. Then she accompanied a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and entangled many in grievous sin. She was in that city of the feast of the exaltation of the Holy Cross, and went with the crowd to the church which contained the precious wood. The rest entered and adored but Mary was invisibly held back. In that instant, her misery and pollution burst upon her. Turning to the Immaculate Mother, faced her in the porch, she vowed thenceforth to do penance if she might enter and stand like Magdalene beside the cross. Then she entered in. As she knelt before Our Lady, on leaving the church, a voice came to her which said, Pass over Jordan, and thou shalt find rest. She went into the wilderness, and there, in 420, 47 years after, the abbot Zosimus met her. She told him that for 17 years the old songs and scenes had haunted her. Ever since, she had had perfect peace. At her request, he brought her on Holy Thursday the sacred body of Christ. She bade him return again after a year, and this time he found her corpse upon the sand, with an inscription saying, Bury here the body of Mary the sinner. Reflection Blessed John Columbini was converted to God by reading St. Mary's life. Let us, too, learn from her, not to be content with confessing and lamenting our sins, but to fly from what leads us to commit them. St. John the Almoner St. John was married, but when his wife and two children died, he considered it a call from God to lead a perfect life. He began to give away all he possessed in alms, and became known throughout the East as the almoner. 
he was appointed Patriarch of Alexandria, but before he would take possession of his see, he told his servants to go over the town and bring him a list of his lords, meaning the poor. They brought word that there were 7,500 of them, and these he undertook to feed every day. On Wednesday and Friday in every week, he sat on a bench before the church to hear the complaints of the needy and aggrieved. Nor would he permit his servants to taste food until their wrongs were redressed. The fear of death was ever before him, and he never spoke an idle word. He turned those out of the church whom he saw talking and forbade all detractors to enter his house. He left seventy churches in Alexandria, where he had found but seven. A merchant received from St. John five pounds weight of gold to buy merchandise. Having suffered shipwreck and lost all, he had again recourse to John, who said, Some of your merchandise was ill-gotten, and gave him ten pounds more, but the next voyage he lost the ship as well as his goods. John then said, The ship was wrongfully acquired. Take fifteen pounds of gold, buy corn with it, and put it in one of my ships. This time the merchant was carried by the winds without his own knowledge to England, where there was a famine, and he sold the corn for its weight in tin, and on his return he found the tin changed to finest silver. St. John died in Cyprus, his native place, about the year 619. End of section 9「Section 10 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Mayer. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June by John Gilmary Shea. April 10, St. Bottomus, Martyr. Bottomus was a rich and noble citizen of Bothlepeta in Persia, who founded a monastery near that city which he governed with great sanctity. He conducted his religious in the paths of perfection with sweetness, prudence, and charity. To crown his virtue, God permitted him, with seven of his monks, to be apprehended by the followers of King Sapor in the thirty-sixth year of his persecution. He lay four months in a dungeon loaded with chains, during which lingering martyrdom he every day received a number of stripes. But he triumphed over his torments by the patience and joy with which he suffered them for Christ. At the same time a Christian lord named Nerson, prince of Arya, was cast into prison because he refused to adore the sun. At first he showed some resolution, but at the sight of tortures his constancy failed him, and he promised to conform. The king, to try if his change was sincere, ordered Bottomus to be introduced into the prison of Nersan, which was a chamber in the royal palace, and sent word to Nersan that if he would dispatch Bottomus, he should be restored to his liberty and former dignities. The wretch accepted the condition. A sword was put into his hand, and he advanced to plunge it into the breast of the abbot. But being seized with a sudden terror, he stopped short, and remained some time without being able to lift up his arm to strike. He had neither courage to repent, nor heart to accomplish his crime. He strove, however, to harden himself, and continued with a trembling hand to aim at the sides of the martyr. Fear, shame, remorse, and respect for the martyr made his strokes forceless and unsteady, and so great was the number of the martyr's wounds that the bystanders were in admiration at his invincible patience. After four strokes the martyr's head was severed from the trunk. Nerson, a short time after, falling into public disgrace, perished by the sword. The body of St. Bottomus was reproachfully cast out of the city by the infidels, but was secretly carried away and interred by the Christians. His disciples were released from their chains four years afterward upon the death of King Sapor. St. Bottomus suffered on the 10th of April in the year 376. Reflection. Oh, what ravishing delights does the soul taste which is accustomed, by a familiar habit, to converse in the heaven of its own interior with the three persons of the adorable Trinity. Worldlings wonder how holy solitaries can pass their whole time buried in the most profound solitude and silence. 
But those who have had any experience of this happiness are surprised, with far greater reason, how it is possible that any souls which are created to converse eternally with God should here live in constant dissipation, seldom entertaining a devout thought of him whose charms and sweet conversation eternally ravish all the blessed. End of section 10. Section 11 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmarie Shea. April the 11th, St. Leo the Great. Leo was born at Rome. He embraced the sacred ministry, was made archdeacon of the Roman Church by St. Celestine, and under him and Sixtus III had a large share in governing the Church. On the death of Sixtus, Leo was chosen Pope and consecrated on St. Michael's Day, 440, amid great joy. It was a time of terrible trial. Vandals and Huns were wasting the provinces of the empire, and Nestorians, Pelagians, and other heretics wrought more grievous havoc among souls. Whilst Leo's zeal made head against these perils, there arose the new heresy of Eutyches, who confounded the two natures of Christ. At once the vigilant pastor proclaimed the true doctrine of the Incarnation in his famous tome, but fostered by the Byzantine court, the heresy gained a strong hold among the eastern monks and bishops. After three years of unceasing toil, Leo brought about its solemn condemnation by the Council of Chalcedon, the fathers all signing his tome and exclaiming, Peter hath spoken by Leo. Soon after, Attila with his Huns broke into Italy and marched through its burning cities upon Rome. Leo went out boldly to meet him and prevailed on him to turn back. Astonished to see the terrible Attila, the scourge of God, fresh from the sack of Aquileia, Milan, Pavia, with the rich prize of Rome within his grasp, turn his great host back to the Danube at the saint's word, his chiefs asked him why he had acted so strangely. He answered that he saw two venerable personages, supposed to be Saints Peter and Paul, standing behind Leo and impressed by this vision, he withdrew. If the perils of the church are as great now as in St. Leo's day, St. Peter's solicitude is not less. Two years later the city fell a prey to the vandals, but even then Leo saved it from destruction. He died A.D. 461, having ruled the church twenty years. Reflection Leo loved to ascribe all the fruits of his unsparing labors to the glorious chief of the apostles, who he often declared lives and governs in his successors. End of section 11. Recording by Todd Marchand. Section 12 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Mayer. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmary Shea. April 12th, St. Julius, Pope. St. Julius was a Roman and chosen Pope on the 6th of February in 337. The Arian bishops in the East sent to him three deputies to accuse St. Athanasius, the zealous patriarch of Alexandria. These accusations, as the order of justice required, Julius imparted to Athanasius, who thereupon sent his deputies to Rome. When upon an impartial hearing the advocates of the heretics were confounded and silenced upon every article of their accusation, 
The Arians then demanded a council, and the Pope assembled one in Rome 341. The Arians, instead of appearing, held a pretended council at Antioch in 341, in which they presumed to appoint one Gregory, an impious Arian, Bishop of Alexandria, to tame the Pope's legates beyond the time mentioned for their appearance, and then wrote to His Holiness, alleging a pretended impossibility of their appearing, on account of the Persian War and other impediments. The Pope easily saw through these pretenses, and in a council at Rome examined the cause of St. Athanasius, declared him innocent of the things laid to his charge by the Arians, and confirmed him in his see. He also acquitted Marcellus of Ancria upon his orthodox profession of faith. He drew up and sent by Count Gabian to the Oriental Eusebian bishops, who had first demanded a council, and then refused to appear in it, an excellent letter which is looked upon as one of the finest monuments of ecclesiastical antiquity. Finding the Eusebians still obstinate, he moved Constans, emperor of the West, to demand the concurrence of his brother Constantius in the assembling of a general council at Sardisia in Illyricum. This was opened in May 347, and declared St. Athanasius and Marcellus of Ancria orthodox and innocent, deposed certain Arian bishops, and framed twenty-one canons of discipline. St. Julius reigned fifteen years, two months, and six days, dying on the 12th of April, 352. End of section 12. Section 13 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmory Shea. April the 13th, St. Hermengild, Martyr. Leovigild, king of the Visigoths, had two sons, Hermengild and Rechard, who reigned conjointly with him. All three were Arians, but Hermengild married a zealous Catholic, the daughter of Sigbert, king of France, and by her holy example was converted to the faith. His father, on hearing the news, denounced him as a traitor and marched to seize his person. Hermengild tried to rally the Catholics of Spain in his defence, but they were too weak to make any stand, and, after a two years' fruitless struggle, he surrendered on the assurance of a free pardon. When safely in the royal camp, the king had him loaded with fetters and cast into a foul dungeon at Seville. Tortures and bribes were in turn employed to shake his faith, but Hermengild wrote his father that he held the crown as nothing and preferred to lose sceptre and life rather than betray the truth of God. At length, on Easter night, an Arian bishop entered his cell and promised him his father's pardon if he would but receive communion at his hands. Hermengild indignantly rejected the offer and knelt with joy for his death stroke. The same night, a light streaming from his cell told the Christians who were watching near that the martyr had won his crown and was keeping his Easter with the saints in glory. Leovigild on his deathbed, though still an Arian, bade Rechard seek out St. Leander, whom he had himself cruelly persecuted, and, following Hermengild's example, be received by him into the church. Rechard did so, and on his father's death laboured so earnestly for the extirpation of Arianism that he brought over the whole nation of the Visigoths to the church. Nor is it to be wondered, says St. Gregory, that he came thus to be a preacher of the true faith, seeing that he was brother of a martyr, whose merits did help him to bring so many into the lap of God's church. Reflection St. Hermengild teaches us that constancy and sacrifice are the best arguments for the faith, and the surest way to win souls to God. End of section 13. Recording by Florence. Section 14 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, 
April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmory Shea. April the 14th, St. Benizet, or Little Bennet. St. Benizet kept his mother's sheep in the country, and as a mere child was devoted to practices of piety. As many persons were drowned in crossing the Rhone, Benizet was inspired by God to build a bridge over that rapid river at Avignon. He obtained the approbation of the bishop, proved his mission by miracles, and began the work in 1177, which he directed during seven years. He died when the difficulty of the undertaking was over, in 1184. This is attested by public monuments drawn up at that time, and still preserved at Avignon, where the story is in everybody's mouth. His body was buried upon the bridge itself, which was not completely finished till four years after his decease. The structure whereof was attended with miracles, from the first laying of the foundations till it was completed in 1188. Other miracles wrought after this at his tomb induced the city to build a chapel upon the bridge in which his body lay nearly 500 years. But in 1669, a greater part of the bridge falling down through the impetuosity of the waters, the coffin was taken up and being opened in 1670 in presence of the Grand Vicar, during the vacancy of the archiepiscopal see, the body was found entire, without the least sign of corruption. Even the bowels were perfectly sound, and the colour of the eyes lively and sprightly, though, through the dampness of the situation, the iron bars about the coffin were much damaged with rust. The body was found in the same condition by the Archbishop of Avignon in 1674, when, accompanied by the Bishop of Orange and a great concourse of nobility, he performed the translation of it with great pomp into the church of the Celestines, this order having obtained of Louis the Fourteenth the honour of being entrusted with the custody of his relics till such time as the bridge and chapel should be rebuilt. Reflection Let us pray for perseverance in good works. St. Augustine says, when the saints pray in the words which Christ taught, they ask for little else than the gift of perseverance. End of section 14. Recording by Florence. Section 15 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmory Shea. April the 15th, St. Paternus, Bishop. St. Paternus was born at Poitiers about the year 482. His father, Patranus, with the consent of his wife, went into Ireland where he ended his days in holy solitude. Paternus, fired by his example, embraced a monastic life in the Abbey of Mar. After some time, burning with a desire of attaining to the perfection of Christian virtue, he passed over to Wales, and in Cardiganshire founded a monastery called Lan Patern Var, or the Church of the Great Paternus. He made a visit to his father in Ireland, but being called back to his monastery of Marne, he soon after retired with St. Scubilion, a monk of that house, and embraced an austere and heretical life in the forests of Sissy, in the diocese of Coutances, near the sea, having first obtained leave of the bishop and of the lord of the place. This desert, which was then of great extent, but which has been since gradually gained upon by the sea, was anciently in great request among the Druids. St. Paternus converted to the faith the idolaters of that and many neighbouring parts as far as Bayeux, and prevailed upon them to demolish a pagan temple in this desert, which was held in great veneration by the ancient Gauls. 
In his old age, he was consecrated Bishop of Avranches by Germanus, Bishop of Rouen. Some false brethren, having created a division of opinion among the bishops of the province with respect to St. Paternus, he preferred retiring rather than to afford any ground for dissension, and, after governing his diocese for thirteen years, he withdrew to a solitude in France, and there ended his days about the year 550. Reflection The greatest sacrifices imposed by the love of peace will appear as naught if we call to mind the example of our Saviour and remember his words, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. End of section 15. Reading by Florence. Section 16 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmary Shea. April 16, 18 Martyrs of Saragossa and St. Encratis, or Engratia, Virgin, Martyr. St. Opatius and seventeen other holy men received the crown of martyrdom on the same day, at Saragossa, under the cruel governor Dacian, in the persecution of Diocletian in 304. Two others, Caius and Crementius, died of their torments after a second conflict. The church also celebrates on this day the triumph of St. Encratis, or Engratia, Virgin. She was a native of Portugal. Her father had promised her in marriage to a man of quality in Roussillon, but fearing the dangers and despising the vanities of the world and resolving to preserve her virginity in order to appear more agreeable to her heavenly spouse and serve him without hindrance, she stole from her father's house and fled privately to Saragossa, where the persecution was hottest under the eyes of Dacian. She even reproached him with his barbarities, upon which he ordered her to be long tormented in the most inhuman manner. Her sides were torn with iron hooks, and one of her breasts was cut off, so that the inner parts of her chest were exposed to view, and part of her liver was pulled out. In this condition she was sent back to prison, being still alive, and died by the mortifying of her wounds in 304. The relics of all these martyrs were found at Saragossa in 1389. Reflection. Men do not pursue temporal goods at haphazard or by fits and starts. Let us be as punctual and orderly in the service of God, not casting about for new paths, but perfecting our ordinary devotions. If we persevere in these, paradise is ours. End of section 16. Section 17 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June by John Gilmary Shea. April 17th, St. Anicetus, Pope, Martyr. St. Anicetus succeeded St. Pius and sat about eight years from 165 to 173. If he did not shed his blood for the faith, he at least purchased the title of martyr by great sufferings and dangers. He received a visit from St. Polycarp and tolerated the custom of the Asiatics in celebrating Easter on the fourteenth day of the first moon after the vernal equinox with the Jews. His vigilance protected his flock from the wiles of the heretics Valentine and Marcion, who sought to corrupt the faith in the capital of the world. The first thirty-six bishops at Rome, down to Liberius, and this one accepted, all the popes to Symmachus, the 52nd, in 498, are honored among the saints, and out of 248 popes from St. Peter to Clement the 13th, 78 are named in the Roman martyology. 
in the primitive ages the spirit of fervor and perfect sanctity which is nowadays so rarely to be found was conspicuous in most of the faithful and especially in their pastors the whole tenor of their lives breathed it in such a manner as to render them the miracles of the world angels on earth living copies of their divine redeemer the odor of whose virtues and holy law and religion they spread on every side reflection if after making the most solemn protestations of inviolable friendship and affection for a fellow creature we should the next moment revile and condemn him without having received any provocation or affront and this habitually would not the whole world justly call our protestations hypocrisy and our pretended friendship a mockery let us by this rule judge if our love of god be sovereign so long as our inconstancy betrays the insincerity of our hearts End of section 17section eighteen of little victoria lives of the saints volume two april through june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org little victoria lives of the saints volume two april through june by john gilmary shea april eighteenth saint apollonius martyr marcus aurelius had persecuted the christians but his son Commodus, who in 180 seceded him, showed himself favorable to them out of regard to his empress Marcia, who was an admirer of the faith. During this calm, the number of the faithful was exceedingly increased, and many persons of the first rank, among them Apollonius, a Roman senator, enlisted themselves under the banner of the cross. He was a person very well versed both in philosophy and the Holy Scripture, in the midst of the peace which the church enjoyed he was publicly accused of christianity by one of his own slaves the slave was immediately condemned to have his legs broken and to be put to death in consequence of an edict of marcus aurelius who without repealing the former laws against convicted christians ordered by it that their accusers should be put to death the slave being executed the same judge sent an order to saint apollonius to renounce his religion as he valued his life and fortune the saint courageously rejected such ignominious terms of safety wherefore perennis referred him to the judgment of the roman senate to give an account of his faith to that body persisting in his refusal to comply with the condition the saint was condemned by a decree of the senate and beheaded about the year one eighty six reflection it is the prerogative of the christian religion to inspire men with such resolution and form them to such heroism that they rejoice to sacrifice their life to truth this is not the bare force and exertion of nature but the undoubted power of the almighty whose strength is thus made perfect in weakness every christian ought by his manner to bear witness to the sanctity of his faith such would be the force of universal good example that no libertine or infidel could withstand it end of section eighteen section nineteen of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june by john gilmary shea april nineteenth saint eliphage archbishop saint eliphage was born in the year nine fifty four of a noble saxon family he first became a monk in the monastery of deerhurst near tewkesbury england and afterwards lived as a hermit near bath where he founded a community under the rule of saint benedict became its first abbot at thirty years of age he was chosen bishop of winchester and twenty-two years later he became archbishop of canterbury in ten eleven when the danes landed in kent and took the city of canterbury putting all to fire and sword st elphage was captured and carried off in the expectation of a large ransom 
he was unwilling that his ruined church and people should be put to such expense and was kept in the loathsome prison at greenwich for seven months while so confined some friends came and urged him to lay a tax upon his tenants to raise the sum demanded for his ransom what reward can i hope for said he if i spend upon myself what belongs to the poor better give up to the poor what is ours than take from them the little which is their own as he still refused to give ransom the enraged danes fell upon him in a fury beat him with the blunt sides of their weapons and bruised him with stones until one whom the saint had baptized shortly before put an end to his sufferings by the blow of an axe he died on easter saturday april nineteenth ten twelve his last words being a prayer for his murderers his body was first buried in st paul's london but was afterwards translated to canterbury by king canute a church dedicated to st elphich still stands upon the place of his martyrdom at greenwich reflection those who are in high positions should consider themselves as stewards rather than masters of the wealth or power entrusted to them for the benefit of the poor and weak st elphidge died rather than extort his ransom from the poor tenants of the church lands end of section nineteen Section 20 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea. April 20th, St. Marcellinus, Bishop st marcellinus was born in africa of a noble family accompanied by vincent and domninus he went over into gaul and there preached the gospel with great success in the neighborhood of the alps he afterwards settled at imbrun where he built a chapel in which he passed his nights in prayer after laboring all the day in the exercise of his sacred calling by his pious example as well as by his earnest words he converted many of the heathens among whom he lived he was afterwards made bishop of the people whom he had won over to christ but the date of his consecration is not positively known burning with zeal for the glory of god he sent vincent and domninos to preach the faith in those parts which he could not visit in person he died at embrun about the year three seventy four and was there interred st gregory of tours who speaks of marcellinus in terms of highest praise mentions many miracles as happening at his tomb reflection though you may not be called upon to preach at least endeavor to set a good example remembering that deeds often speak louder than words end of section twenty section twenty one of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april to june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april to june by john gilmary she april twenty first saint anselm archbishop anselm was a native of piedmont when a boy of fifteen being forbidden to enter religion, he for a while lost his fervor, left his home, and went to various schools in France. At length his vocation revived, and he became a monk at Beck in Normandy. The fame of his sanctity in this cloister led William Rufus, when dangerously ill, to take him for his confessor, and to name him to the vacant see of Canterbury now began the strife of anselm's life with new health the king relapsed into his former sins plundered the church lands scorned the archbishop's rebukes and forbade him to go to rome for the pallium anselm went and returned only to enter into a more bitter strife with william's successor henry i this sovereign claimed the right of investing prelates with the ring and crozier symbols of the spiritual jurisdiction which belongs to the church alone 
the worldly prelates did not scruple to call St. Anselm a traitor for his defense of the Pope's supremacy, on which the saint rose, and with calm dignity exclaimed, If any man pretends that I violate my face to my king, because I will not reject the authority of the Holy See of Rome, let him stand forth, and in the name of God I will answer him as I ought. No one took up the challenge, and to the disappointment of the king, the barons sided with the saint, for they respected his courage, and saw that his cause was their own. Sooner than yield, the archbishop went again into exile, till at last the king was obliged to submit to the feeble but inflexible old man. In the midst of his harassing cares, St. Anselm found time for writings, which have made him celebrated as the father of scholastic theology, while in metaphysics and in science he had few equals. He is yet more famous for his devotion to our blessed lady, whose feast of the Immaculate Conception he was the first to establish in the West. He died A.D. 1109. Reflection Whoever, like St. Anselm, contends for the Church's rights, is fighting on the side of God against the tyranny of Satan. End of section 21「Section 22 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmary Shee. April 22nd, St. Soter, Pope martyr and saint leonid's martyr saint soter was raised to the papacy upon the death of saint aniketus in 173 by the sweetness of his discourses he comforted all persons with the tenderness of a father and assisted the indigent with liberal alms especially those who suffered for the faith he liberally extended his charities according to the custom of his predecessors to remote churches particularly to that of Corinth, to which he addressed an excellent letter, as St. Dionysius of Corinth testifies in his letter of thanks, who adds that his letter was found worthy to be read for their edification on Sundays at their assemblies to celebrate the divine mysteries, together with the letter of St. Clement Pope. St. Soter vigorously opposed the heresy of Montanus, and governed the church to the year 177. St. Leonid's Martyr The Emperor Severus, in the year 202, which was the tenth of his reign, raised a bloody persecution which filled the whole empire with martyrs, but especially Egypt. The most illustrious of those who by their triumphs ennobled and edified the city of Alexandria was Leonides, father of the great Oregon. He was a Christian philosopher, and excellently versed, both in the profane and sacred sciences. He had seven sons, the eldest of whom was Oregon, whom he brought up with abundance of care, returning God thanks for having blessed him with a son of such an excellent disposition for learning, and a very great zeal for piety. These qualifications endeared him greatly to his father, who, after his son was baptized, would come to his bedside while he was asleep, and opening his bosom, kiss it respectfully, as being the temple of the Holy Ghost. When the persecution raged at Alexandria, under Laetus, governor of Egypt, in the tenth year of Severus, Leonides was cast into prison. Oregon, who was then only seventeen years of age, burned with an incredible desire of martyrdom, and sought every opportunity of meeting with it. But his mother conjured him not to forsake her, and his ardor being redoubled at the sight of his father's chains, she was forced to lock up all his clothes to oblige him to stay at home. So, not being able to do any more, he wrote a letter to his father in very moving terms, strongly exhorting him to look on the crown that was offered him with courage and joy, adding this clause. Take heed, sir, 
that for our sakes you do not change your mind. Leonides was accordingly beheaded for the faith in 202, his estates and goods being all confiscated and seized for the emperor's use, his widow was left with seven children to maintain in the poorest condition imaginable, but divine providence was both her comfort and support. End of section 22「Section 23 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmary Shee. April 23rd, St. George Martyr. St. George was born in Cappadocia at the close of the third century of Christian parents. In early youth he chose a soldier's life, and soon obtained the favor of Diocletian, who advanced him to the grade of tribune. When, however, the emperor began to persecute the Christians, George rebuked him at once sternly and openly for his cruelty and threw up his commission. He was in consequence subjected to a lengthened series of torments, and finally beheaded. There was something so inspiriting in the defiant cheerfulness of the young soldier that every Christian felt a personal share in this triumph of Christian fortitude, and as years rolled on, St. George became a type of successful combat against evil, the slayer of the dragon, the darling theme of camp song and story, until, so thick a shade his very glory round him made, that his real lineaments became hard to trace. Even beyond the circle of Christendom, he was held in honor, and invading Saracens taught themselves to accept from desecration the image of him they hailed as the white-horsed knight. The devotion to St. George is one of the most ancient and widely spread in the Church. In the East, a church of St. George is ascribed to Constantine, and his name is invoked in the most ancient liturgies, whilst in the West, Malta, Barcelona, Valencia, Aragon, Genoa, and England have chosen him as their patron. Reflection What shall I say of fortitude, without which neither wisdom nor justice is of any worth? Fortitude is not of the body, but is a constancy of soul. Wherewith we are conquerors in righteousness, patiently bear all adversities, and in prosperity are not puffed up. This fortitude he lacks, who is overcome by pride, anger, greed, drunkenness, and the like. Neither have they fortitude, who, when in adversity, make shift to escape their soul's expense. Wherefore the Lord saith, Fear not those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. In like manner, those who are puffed up in prosperity and abandon themselves to excessive joviality cannot be called strong. For how can they be called strong, who cannot hide and repress the heart's emotion? Fortitude is never conquered, or, if conquered, is not fortitude. St. Bruno End of section 23 Section 24 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmarie Shee. April 24th, St. Fidelus of Sigmaringen. Fidelis was born at Sigmaringen in 1577, of noble parents. In his youth, he frequently approached the sacraments, visited the sick and the poor, and spent moreover many hours before the altar. For a time, he followed the legal profession, and was remarkable for his advocacy of the poor and his respectful language towards his opponents. Finding it difficult to become both a rich lawyer and a good Christian, Fidelis entered the Capuchin order and embraced a life of austerity and prayer. Hair shirts, iron-pointed girdles, and disciplines were penances too light for his fervor. 
and being filled with the desire of martyrdom, he rejoiced at being sent to Switzerland by the newly founded Congregation of Propaganda, and braved every peril to rescue souls from the diabolical heresy of Calvin. When preaching at service, he was fired at by a Calvinist, but the fear of death could not deter him from proclaiming divine truth. After his sermon, he was waylaid by a body of Protestants, headed by a minister, who attacked him and tried to force him to embrace their so-called reform. But he said, I came to refute your errors, not to embrace them. I will never renounce Catholic doctrine, which is the truth of all ages, and I fear not death. On this, they fell upon him with their poniards, and the first martyr of propaganda went to receive his palm. Reflection We delight in decorating the altars of God with flowers, lights, and jewels, and it is right to do so. But if we wish to offer to God gifts of higher value, let us, in imitation of St. Fidelis, save the souls who but for us would be lost, for so we shall after him, as it were, the jewels of paradise. End of section 24「Section 25 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmary Shee. April 25th, St. Mark, Evangelist. St. Mark was converted to the faith by the Prince of the Apostles, whom he afterwards accompanied to Rome, acting there as his secretary or interpreter. When St. Peter was writing his first epistle to the churches of Asia, he affectionately joins with his own salutation that of his faithful companion, whom he calls My Son Mark. The Roman people entreated St. Mark to put in writing for them the substance of St. Peter's frequent discourses on our Lord's life, this the evangelist did under the eye and with the express sanction of the apostle, and every page of his brief but graphic gospel so bore the impress of St. Peter's character that the fathers used to name it Peter's Gospel. St. Mark was now sent to Egypt to found the Church of Alexandria. Here his disciples became the wonder of the world for their piety and asceticism so that St. Jerome speaks of St. Mark as the father of the anchorites, who at a later time thronged the Egyptian deserts. Here, too, he set up the first Christian school, the fruitful mother of many illustrious doctors and bishops. After governing his see for many years, St. Mark was one day seized by the heathen, dragged by ropes over stones and thrown into prison. On the morrow the torture was repeated, and having been consoled by a vision of angels and the voice of Jesus, St. Mark went to his reward. It is to St. Mark that we owe the many slight touches which often give such vivid colouring to the gospel scenes, and help us to picture to ourselves the very gestures and looks of our blessed Lord. It is he alone who notes that in the temptation Jesus was with the beasts, that he slept in the boat on a pillow, that he embraced the little children. He alone preserves for us the commanding words, Peace, be still, by which the storm was quelled, or even the very sounds of his voice, the Epheta and Talitha Kumi, by which the dumb were made to speak and the dead to rise. So too, the looking round about with anger and the sighing deeply, long treasured in the memory of the penitent apostle, who was himself converted by his Saviour's look, are here recorded by his faithful interpreter. Reflection Learn from St. Mark to keep the image of the Son of Man ever before your mind, and to ponder every syllable which fell from his lips. End of section 25 Section 26 of 
Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmary Shee. April 26. Saints Cletus and Marcellinus, Popes and Martyrs. St. Cletus was the third bishop of Rome, and succeeded St. Linus, which circumstance alone shows his eminent virtue among the first disciples of St. Peter in the West. He sat twelve years, from seventy-six to eighty-nine. The canon of the Roman Mass, Bede and other martyrologists, style him as martyr. He was buried near St. Linus in the Vatican, and his relics still remain in that church. St. Marcellinus succeeded St. Gaius in the bishopric of Rome in 296, about the time that Diocletian set himself up for a deity, and impiously claimed divine honors. In those stormy times of persecution, Marcellinus acquired great glory. He sat in St. Peter's chair eight years, three months, and twenty-five days, dying in 304, a year after the cruel persecution broke out, in which he gained much honor. He has been styled a martyr, though his blood was not shed in the cause of religion. Reflection It is a fundamental maxim of the Christian morality, and a truth which Christ has established in the clearest terms, and in innumerable passages of the gospel, that the cross or sufferings and mortification are the road to eternal bliss. They, therefore, who lead not here a crucified and mortified life, are unworthy ever to possess the unspeakable joys of his kingdom. Our Lord himself, our model on our head, walked in this path, and his great apostle puts us in mind that he entered into bliss only by his blood and by the cross. End of section 26《セクション27 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea. April 27th, Saint Zita, Virgin. Zita lived for forty-eight years in the service of Fatinelli, a citizen of Lucca. During this time she rose each morning, while the household was asleep, to hear Mass, and then toiled incessantly till night came, doing the work of others as well as her own. Once Zita, absorbed in prayer, remained in church past the usual hour of her bread-making. She hastened home, reproaching herself with neglect of duty, and found the bread made and ready for the oven. She never doubted that her mistress or one of her servants had needed it, and going to them thanked them, but they were astonished. No human being had made the bread. A delicious perfume rose from it, for angels had made it during her prayer. For years her master and mistress treated her as a mere drudge, while her fellow servants, resenting her diligence as they reproached to themselves, insulted and struck her. Zita united these sufferings with those of Christ her Lord, never changing the sweet tone of her voice, nor forgetting her gentle and quiet ways. At length Fatinelli, seeing the success which attended her undertakings, gave her charge of his children and of the household. She dreaded this dignity more than the worst humiliation, but scrupulously fulfilled her trust. By her holy economy her master's goods were multiplied, while the poor were fed at his door. Gradually her unfailing patience conquered the jealousy of her fellow servants, and she became their advocate with their hot-tempered master, who dared not give way to his anger before Zita. In the end her prayer and toil sanctified the whole house, and drew down upon it the benediction of heaven. She died A.D. 1272, and in the moment of her death a bright star appearing above her attic showed that she had gained eternal rest. Reflection what must I do to be saved, said a certain one in fear of damnation. Work and pray, pray and work, a voice replied, and thou shalt be saved. 
the whole life of st zita teaches us this truth end of section twenty seven section twenty eight of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june by john gilmary shea april twenty eighth st paul of the cross and st vitalis martyr st paul of the cross the eighty-one years of this saint's life were modelled on the passion of jesus christ in his childhood when praying in church a heavy bench fell on his foot but the boy took no notice of the bleeding wound and spoke of it as a rose sent from god a few years later a vision of a scourge with love written on its lashes assured him that his thirst for penance would be satisfied in the hope of dying for the faith he enlisted in a crusade against the turks but a voice from the tabernacle warned him that he was to serve christ alone and that he should found a congregation in his honor at the command of his bishop he began while a layman to preach the passion and a series of crosses tried the reality of his vocation all his first companions save his brother deserted him the sovereign pontiff refused him an audience and it was only after a delay of seventeen years that the papal approbation was obtained and the first house of the passionists was opened on monte argentario the spot which our lady had pointed out st paul chose as the badge of his order a heart with three nails in memory of the sufferings of jesus but for himself he invented a more secret and durable sign moved by the same holy impulse as blessed henry suso st jane francis and other saints he branded on his side the holy name and its characters were found there after death his heart beat with a supernatural palpitation which was especially vehement on fridays and the heat at times was so intense as to scorch his shirt in the region of his heart through fifty years of incessant bodily pain and amidst all his trials paul read the love of jesus everywhere and would cry out to the flowers and grass oh be quiet be quiet as if they were reproaching him with ingratitude he died whilst the passion was being read to him and so passed with jesus from the cross to glory st vitalis martyr st vitalis was a citizen of milan and is said to have been the father of saints gervasius and protasius the divine providence conducted him to ravenna where he saw a christian named orsicinus who was condemned to lose his head for his faith standing aghast at the sight of death and seeming ready to yield vitalis was extremely moved at this spectacle he knew his double obligation of preferring the glory of god and the eternal salvation of his neighbor to his own corporal life he therefore boldly and successfully encouraged or Sinus to triumph over death and after his martyrdom carried off his body and respectfully interred it the judge whose name was paulinus being informed of this caused vitalis to be apprehended stretched on the rack and after other torments to be buried alive in a place called the palm tree in ravenna his wife valeria returning from ravenna to milan was beaten to death by peasants because she refused to join them in an idolatrous festival and riot reflection we are not all called to the sacrifice of martyrdom but we are all bound to make our lives a continued sacrifice of ourselves to god and to perform every action in this perfect spirit of sacrifice thus we shall both live and die to god perfectly resigned to his holy will and all his appointments End of section twenty eight Section 29 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmary Shea. April 29. 
St. Peter, Martyr, and St. Hugh, Abbot of Cluny. St. Peter, Martyr. In 1205, the glorious martyr Peter was born at Verona of heretical parents. He went to a Catholic school, and his Manichaean uncle asked what he learned. The creed, answered Peter, I believe in God, creator of heaven and earth. No persuasion could shake his faith, and at fifteen he received the habit from St. Dominic himself at Bologna. After ordination, he preached to the heretics of Lombardy, and converted multitudes. St. Peter was constantly obliged to dispute with heretics, and although he was able to confound them, still the devil took occasion thence to tempt him once against faith. Instantly he had recourse to prayer before an image of Our Lady, and heard a voice saying to him the words of Jesus Christ in the Gospel, I have prayed for thee, Peter, that thy faith may not fail, and thou shalt confirm thy brethren in it. Once when exhorting a vast crowd under the burning sun, the heretics defied him to procure shade. He prayed, and a cloud overshadowed the audience. In spite of his sanctity, he was foully slandered and even punished for immorality. He submitted humbly, but complained in prayer to Jesus crucified. The crucifix spoke, and I, Peter, what did I do? Every day, as he elevated at Mass the precious blood, he prayed, Grant, Lord, that I may die for thee, who for me didst die. His prayer was answered. The heretics confounded by him sought his life. Two of them attacked him as he was returning to Milan, and struck his head with an axe. St. Peter fell, commended himself to God, dipped his finger in his own blood, and wrote on the ground, I believe in God, creator of heaven and earth. They then stabbed him in the side, and he received his crown. Reflection. From a boy, St. Peter boldly professed his faith among heretics. He spent his life in preaching the faith to heretics, and received the glorious and long-desired crown of martyrdom from heretics. We are surrounded by heretics. Are we courageous, firm, zealous, full of prayer for their conversion, unflinching in our profession of faith? St. Hugh, Abbot of Cluny St. Hugh was a prince related to the sovereign house of the Dukes of Burgundy, and had his education under the tuition of his pious mother, and under the care of Hugh, Bishop of Auxerre, his great uncle. From his infancy he was exceedingly given to prayer and meditation, and his life was remarkably innocent and holy. One day, hearing an account of the wonderful sanctity of the monks of Cluny, under St. Odilo, he was so moved that he set out that moment, and going thither, humbly begged the monastic habit. After a rigid novitiate, he made his profession in 1039, being sixteen years old. His extraordinary virtue, especially his admirable humility, obedience, charity, sweetness, prudence, and zeal, gained him the respect of the whole community, and upon the death of St. Odilo, in 1049, though only twenty-five years old, he succeeded to the government of that great abbey, which he held sixty-two years. He received to the religious profession Hugh, Duke of Burgundy, and died on the twenty-ninth of April, in 1109, aged eighty-five. He was canonized twelve years after his death by Pope Calixtus II. End of section twenty-nine. Section 30 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmory Shea. April the 30th. St. Catherine of Siena. Catherine, the daughter of a humble tradesman, was raised up to be the guide and guardian of the church in one of the darkest periods of its history, the 14th century. As a child, prayer was her delight. She would say the Hail Mary on each step as she mounted the stairs 
and was granted in reward a vision of Christ in glory. When but seven years old, she made a vow of virginity, and afterwards endured bitter persecution for refusing to marry. Our Lord gave her his heart in exchange for her own, communicated her with his own hands, and stamped on her body the print of his wounds. At the age of fifteen, she entered the Third Order of St. Dominic, but continued to reside in her father's shop, where she united a life of active charity with the prayer of a contemplative saint. From this obscure home, the seraphic virgin was summoned to defend the church's cause. Armed with papal authority and accompanied by three confessors, she travelled throughout Italy, reducing rebellious cities to the obedience of the Holy See and winning hardened souls to God. In the face well nigh of the whole world, she sought out Gregory the Eleventh at Avignon, brought him back to Rome, and by her letters to the kings and queens of Europe, made good the papal cause. She was the counsellor of Urban the Sixth, and sternly rebuked the disloyal cardinals who had part in electing an antipope. Long had the Holy Virgin foretold the terrible schism which began ere she died. Day and night she wept and prayed for unity and peace, but the devil excited the Roman people against the Pope, so that some sought the life of Christ's vicar. With intense earnestness did St. Catherine beg our Lord to prevent this enormous crime. In spirit she saw the whole city full of demons, tempting the people to resist and even slay the Pope. The seditious temper was subdued by Catherine's prayers, but the devils vented their malice by scourging the saint herself, who gladly endured all for God and his church. She died at Rome at the age of 33, A.D. 1380. Reflection The seraphic St. Catherine willingly sacrificed the delights of contemplation to labour for the church at the Apollostic Sea. How deeply do the troubles of the church and the consequent loss of souls afflict us. How often do we pray for the Church and the Pope? End of section 30. Reading by Florence. Section 31 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea. May the 1st, Saints Philip and James Apostles. Philip was one of the first chosen disciples of Christ. On the way from Judea to Galilee, our Lord found Philip and said, Follow me. Philip straightway obeyed, and then in his zeal and charity sought to win Nathanael also, saying, We have found him of whom Moses and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth. And when Nathanael in wonder asked, Can any good come out of Nazareth? Philip simply answered, Come and see, and brought him to Jesus. Another characteristic saying of this apostle is preserved for us by St. John. Christ, in his last discourse, had spoken of his Father, and Philip exclaimed in the fervor of his thirst for God, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough. St. James the Less, the author of an inspired epistle, was also one of the twelve. St. Paul tells us that he was favored by a special apparition of Christ after the resurrection. On the dispersion of the apostles among the nations, St. James was left as bishop of Jerusalem, and even the Jews held in such high veneration his purity, mortification, and prayer that they named him the just. The earliest of church historians has handed down many traditions of St. James's sanctity. He was always a virgin, says Hegesippus, and consecrated to God. He drank no wine, wore no sandals on his feet, and but a single garment on his body. He prostrated himself so much in prayer that the skin of his knees was hardened like a camel's hoof. 
The Jews, it is said, used out of respect to touch the hem of his garment. He was indeed a living proof of his own words. The wisdom that is from above first indeed is chaste, then peaceable, modest, full of mercy and good fruits. He sat beside St. Peter and St. Paul at the Council of Jerusalem, and when St. Paul at a later time escaped the fury of the Jews by appealing to Caesar, the people took vengeance on James and crying, The just one hath erred, stoned him to death. Reflection the Church commemorates on the same day Saints Philip and James, whose bodies lie side by side at Rome. They represent to us two aspects of Christian holiness. The first preaches faith, the second works. The one holy aspirations, the other purity of heart. End of section 31. Recording by Todd Marchand. Section 32 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea. May 2nd, St. Athanasius, Bishop. Athanasius was born in Egypt towards the end of the third century, and was from his youth pious, learned, and deeply versed in the sacred writings, as befitted one whom God had chosen to be the champion and defender of his church against the Arian heresy. Though only a deacon, he was chosen by his bishop to go with him to the Council of Nicaea, A.D. 325, and attracted the attention of all by the learning and ability with which he defended the faith. A few months later he became Patriarch of Alexandria, and for forty-six years he bore, often well nigh alone, the whole brunt of the Arian assault. On the refusal of the saint to restore Arius to Catholic communion, the emperor ordered the Patriarch of Constantinople to do so. The wretched Hersiarch took an oath that he had always believed as the church believes, and the patriarch, after vainly using every effort to move the emperor, had recourse to fasting and prayer that God would avert from the church the frightful sacrilege. The day came for the solemn entrance of Arius into the great church of Santa Sophia. The heresiarch and his party set out, glad and in triumph, but before he reached the church, death smote him swiftly and awfully and the dreaded sacrilege was averted. St. Athanasius stood unmoved against four Roman emperors, was banished five times, was the butt of every insult, calumny, and wrong the Arians could devise, and lived in constant peril of death. Though firm and adamant in defense of the faith, he was meek and humble, pleasant and winning in converse, beloved by his flock, unwearied in labors and prayer and mortifications, and in zeal for souls. In the year 373, his stormy life closed in peace, rather that his people would have it so than that his enemies were weary of persecuting him. He left to the church the whole and ancient faith, defended and explained in writings rich in thought and learning, clear, keen, and stately in expression. He is honored as one of the greatest of the doctors of the church. Reflection the Catholic faith, says St. Athanasius, is more precious far than all the riches and treasures of earth, more glorious and greater than all his honors, all his possessions. This it is which saves sinners, gives light to the blind, restores penitence, perfects the just, and is the crown of martyrs. End of section 32 Section 33 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june by john gilmary shea may third the discovery of the holy cross god having restored peace to his church by exalting constantine the great to the imperial throne that pious prince who had triumphed over his enemies by the miraculous power of the cross was very desirous of expressing his veneration for the holy places which had been honored and sanctified by the presence and suffering of our blessed redeemer on earth and accordingly resolved to build a magnificent church in the city of jerusalem st helen the emperor's mother desiring to visit the holy places there undertook a journey into palestine in three twenty six though at that time near eighty years of age and on her arrival at jerusalem was inspired with a great desire to find the identical cross on which christ had suffered for our sins but there was no mark or tradition even amongst the christians to show where it lay the heathens out of an aversion to christianity had done what they could to conceal the place where our saviour was buried by heaping on it a great quantity of stones and rubbish in building on it a temple to venus they had moreover erected a statue of jupiter in the place where our saviour rose from the dead helen to carry out her pious design consulted every one at jerusalem and near it whom she thought likely to assist her in finding out the cross and was credibly informed that if she could find out the sepulchre she would likewise find the instruments of the punishment it being the custom among the jews to make a hole near the place where the body of a criminal was buried and to throw into it whatever belonged to his execution the pious empress therefore ordered the profane buildings to be pulled down the statues to be broken in pieces and the rubbish to be removed and upon digging to a great depth the holy sepulchre and near it three crosses also the nails which had pierced our saviour's body and the title which had been fixed to his cross were found by this discovery they knew that one of the three crosses was that which they were in quest of and that the others belonged to the two malefactors between whom our saviour had been crucified but as the title was found separate from the cross it was difficult to distinguish which of the three crosses was that on which our divine redeemer consummated his sacrifice for the salvation of the world in this perplexity the holy bishop macarius knowing that one of the principal ladies of the city lay extremely ill suggested to the empress to cause the three crosses to be carried to the sick person not doubting but god would discover which the cross they sought for this being done saint macarius prayed that god would have regard to their faith and after his prayer applied the crosses singly to the patient who was immediately and perfectly recovered by the touch of one of the three crosses the other two having been tried without effect st helen full of joy at having found the treasure which she had so earnestly sought and so highly esteemed built a church on the spot and lodged the cross there with great veneration having provided an extraordinary rich case for it she afterwards carried part of it to the emperor constantine then at constantinople who received it with great veneration another part she sent or rather carried to rome to be placed in the church which she had built there called of the holy cross of jerusalem where it remains to this day the title was sent by saint helen to the same church and placed on the top of an arch where it was found in a case of lead in fourteen ninety two the inscription in hebrew greek and latin is in red letters and the wood was whitened thus it was in fourteen ninety two but these colours are since faded also the words jesus and judaeorum are eaten away the board is nine but must have been twelve inches long the main part of the cross st helen enclosed in a silver shrine and committed it to the care of st macarius that it might be delivered down to posterity as an object of veneration it was accordingly kept with singular care and respect in the magnificent church which she and her son built in jerusalem st paulinus relates that though chips were almost daily cut off from it and given to devout persons yet the sacred wood suffered thereby no diminution 
it is affirmed by saint cyril of jerusalem twenty-five years after the discovery that pieces of the cross were spread all over the earth he compares this wonder to the miraculous feeding of five thousand men as recorded in the gospel the discovery of the cross must have happened about the month of may or early in the spring for saint helen went the same year to constantinople and from thence to rome where she died in the arms of her son on the eighteenth of august three hundred and twenty six reflection in every pious undertaking the beginning merely does not suffice whoso shall persevere unto the end he shall be saved end of section thirty three Section 34 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea. May 4th, St. Monica. Monica, the mother of St. Augustine, was born in 332 after a girlhood of singular innocence and piety she was given in marriage to patritius a pagan she at once devoted herself to his conversion praying for him always and winning his reverence and love by the holiness of her life and her affectionate forbearance she was rewarded by seeing him baptized a year before his death when her son augustine went astray in faith and manners her prayers and tears were incessant she was once very urgent with a learned bishop that he would talk to her son in order to bring him to a better mind but he declined despairing of success with one at once so able and so headstrong however on witnessing her prayers and tears he bade her be of good courage for it might not be that the child of those tears should perish by going to italy augustine could for a time free himself from his mother's importunities but he could not escape from her prayers which encompassed him like the providence of god she followed him to italy and there by his marvellous conversion her sorrow was turned into joy at ostia on their homeward journey as augustine and his mother sat at a window conversing of the life of the blessed she turned to him and said son there is nothing now i care for in this life what i shall now do or why i am here i know not the one reason i had for wishing to linger in this life a little longer was that i might see you a catholic christian before i died this has god granted me superabundantly in seeing you reject earthly happiness to become his servant what do i hear a few days afterwards she had an attack of fever and died in the year three eighty seven reflection it is impossible to set any bounds to what persevering prayer may do it gives man a share in the divine omnipotence. st augustine's soul lay bound in the chains of heresy and impurity both of which had by long habit grown inveterate they were broken by his mother's prayers end of section thirty four Section 35 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmary Shea. May 5, St. Pius V. A Dominican friar from his fifteenth year, michael Gislieri, as a simple religious as inquisitor as bishop and as cardinal was famous for his intrepid defence of the church's faith and discipline and for the spotless purity of his own life his first care as pope was to reform the roman court and capital by the strict example of his household and the severe punishment of all offenders he next endeavoured to obtain from the catholic powers the recognition of the tridentine decrees two of which he urgently enforced the residence of bishops and the establishment of diocesan seminaries he revised the missal and breviary and reformed the ecclesiastical music 
nor was he less active in protecting the church without. We see him at the same time supporting the Catholic King of France against the Huguenot rebels, encouraging Mary, Queen of Scots, in the bitterness of her captivity, and excommunicating her rival, the usurper Elizabeth, when the best blood of England had flowed upon the scaffold, and the measure of her crimes was full. But it was at Lepanto that the saint's power was most manifest. There, in October 1571, by the holy league which he had formed, but still more by his prayers to the great mother of God, the aged pontiff crushed the Ottoman forces, and saved Christendom from the Turk. Six months later, St. Pius died, having reigned but six years. St. Pius was accustomed to kiss the feet of his crucifix on leaving or entering his room. One day, the feet moved away from his lips. Sorrow filled his heart, and he made acts of contrition, fearing that he must have committed some secret offense, but still he could not kiss the feet. It was afterwards found that they had been poisoned by an enemy. Reflection Quote, thy cross o lord is the source of all blessings the cause of all graces by it the faithful find strength in weariness glory in shame life in death End quote. saint leo End of section 35。section 36 of little pictorial lives of the saints volume 2 april through june this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmarie Shea. May the 6th, St. John Before the Latin Gate. In the year 95, St. John, who was the only surviving apostle, and governed all the churches of Asia, was apprehended at Ephesus and sent prisoner to Rome. The emperor Domitian did not relent at the sight of the venerable old man, but condemned him to be cast into a cauldron of boiling oil. The martyr doubtless heard with great joy this barbarous sentence, the most cruel torments seemed to him light and most agreeable, because they would, he hoped, unite him forever to his divine Master and Savior. But God accepted his will and crowned his desire. He conferred on him the honor and merit of martyrdom, but suspended the operation of the fire, as he had formerly preserved the three children from hurt in the Babylonian furnace. The seething oil was changed in his regard into an invigorating bath, and the saint came out more refreshed than when he had entered the cauldron. Domitian saw this miracle without drawing from it the least advantage, but remained hardened in his iniquity. However, he contented himself after this with banishing the holy apostle into the little island of Patmos. St. John returned to Ephesus in the reign of Nerva, who by mildness during his short reign of one year and four months, labored to restore the faded luster of the Roman Empire. This glorious triumph of St. John happened without the gate of Rome called Latina. A church which since has always borne this title was consecrated in the same place in memory of this miracle under the first Christian emperors. Reflection St. John suffered above the other saints a martyrdom of love, being a martyr and more than a martyr at the foot of the cross of his divine Master. All his sufferings were by love and compassion imprinted in his soul, and thus shared by him. O oh, singular happiness, to have stood under the cross of Christ! O oh, extraordinary privilege, to have suffered martyrdom in the person of Jesus, and been eyewitness of all he did or endured. If nature revolt within us against suffering, let us call to mind those words of the Divine Master, Thou knowest not now wherefore, 
but thou shalt know hereafter. End of section 36 Recording by Todd Marchand Section 37 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmory Shea. May the 7th, St. Stanislaus, Bishop, Martyr. Stanislaus was born in answer to prayer when his parents were advanced in age. Out of gratitude they educated him for the church, and from a holy priest he became in time Bishop of Krakow. Boleslaus II was then King of Poland, a prince of good disposition, but spoilt by a long course of victory and success. After many acts of lust and cruelty, he outraged the whole kingdom by carrying off the wife of one of his nobles. Against this public scandal, the chaste and gentle bishop alone raised his voice. Having commended the matter to God, he went down to the palace and openly rebuked the king for his crime against God and his subjects and threatened to excommunicate him if he persisted in his sin. To slander the saint's character, Boleslaus suborned the nephews of one Paul, lately dead, to swear that their uncle had never been paid for land bought by the bishop for the church. The saint stood fearlessly before the king's tribunal, though all his witnesses forsook him and guaranteed to bring the dead man to witness for him within three days. On the third day, after many prayers and tears, he raised Paul to life, and led him in his grave clothes before the king. Boleslaus made a show for a while of a better life. Soon, however, he relapsed into the most scandalous excesses, and the bishop, finding all remonstrance useless, pronounced the sentence of excommunication. In defiance of the censure, on May 8, 1079, the king went down to a chapel where the bishop himself was saying a mass, and sent in three companies of soldiers to dispatch him at the altar. Each in turn came out, saying they had been scared by a light from heaven. Then the king rushed in and slew the saint at the altar with his own hand. Reflection The safest correction of vice is a blameless life. Yet there are times when silence would make us unanswerable for the sins of others. At such times let us, in the name of God, rebuke the offender without fear. End of section 37 Recording by Todd Marchand Section 38 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmory Shea. May the 8th, the apparition of St. Michael the Archangel. It is manifest from the Holy Scriptures that God is pleased to make frequent use of the ministry of the heavenly spirits in the dispensations of His providence in this world, and especially towards man. Hence the name of angel, which is not properly a denomination of nature, but office has been appropriated to them. The angels are all pure spirits. They are, by a property of their nature, immortal, as every spirit is. They have the power of moving or conveying themselves from place to place, 
and such is their activity that it is not easy for us to conceive it. Among the holy archangels, there are particularly distinguished in holy writ Saints Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael. Saint Michael, whom the Church honors this day, was the prince of the faithful angels who opposed Lucifer and his associates in their revolt against God. As the devil is the sworn enemy of God's holy church, St. Michael is its special protector against his assaults and stratagems. This holy archangel has ever been honored in the Christian church as her guardian under God and as the protector of the faithful. For God is pleased to employ the zeal and charity of the good angels and their leader against the malice of the devil. To thank His adorable goodness for this benefit of His merciful providence is this festival instituted by the Church in honor of the good angels, in which devotion she has been encouraged by several apparitions of this glorious archangel. Among others, it is recorded that St. Michael, in a vision, admonished the Bishop of Sipanto to build a church in his honor on Mount Gargano, near Manfredonia, in the kingdom of Naples. When the emperor Otho III had, contrary to his word, put to death for rebellion Crescentius, a Roman senator, being touched with remorse, he cast himself at the feet of St. Romuald, who, in satisfaction for his crime, enjoined him to walk barefoot on a penitential pilgrimage to St. Michael's on Mount Gargano which penance he performed in 1002. It is mentioned in particular of this special guardian and protector of the church that, in persecution of Antichrist, he will powerfully stand up in her defense. At that time shall Michael rise up, the great prince, who standeth for the children of thy people. Reflection St. Michael is not only the protector of the church, but of every faithful soul. He defeated the devil by humility. We are enlisted in the same warfare. His arms were humility and ardent love of God. The same must be our weapons. We ought to regard this archangel as our leader under God, and courageously resisting the devil in all his assaults, to cry out, Who can be compared to God? End of section 38. Recording by Todd Marchand. Section 39 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmarie Shea. May the 9th, St. Gregory Nazianzen. Gregory was born of saintly parents and was the chosen friend of St. Basil. They studied together at Athens, turned at the same time from the fairest worldly prospects, and for some years lived together in seclusion, self-discipline, and toil. Gregory was raised almost by force to the priesthood, and was in time made Bishop of Nazianzum by St. Basil, who had become Archbishop of Caesarea. When he was fifty years old, he was chosen, for his rare gifts and his conciliatory disposition, to be Patriarch of Constantinople, then distracted and laid waste by Arian and other heretics. In that city he labored with wonderful success. The Arians were so irritated at the decay of their heresy that they pursued the saint with outrage, calumny, and violence and at length resolved to take away his life. For this purpose they chose a resolute young man who readily undertook the sacrilegious commission. But God did not allow him to carry it out. 
He was touched with remorse and cast himself at the saint's feet, avowing his sinful intent. St. Gregory at once forgave him, treated him with all kindness, and received him amongst his friends, to the wonder and edification of the whole city and to the confusion of the heretics, whose crime had served only as a foil to the virtue of the saint. St. Jerome boasts that he had sat at his feet and calls him his master and his catechist in Holy Scripture. But his lowliness, his austerities, the insignificance of his person, and above all his very success, drew down on him the hatred of the enemies of the faith. He was persecuted by the magistrates, stoned by the rabble, and thwarted and deserted even by his brother bishops. During the second general council he resigned his see, hoping thus to restore peace to the tormented city, and retired to his native town where he died A.D. 390. He was a graceful poet, a preacher at once eloquent and solid, and as a champion of the faith so well equipped, so strenuous and so exact, that he is called St. Gregory the Theologian. Reflection We must overcome our enemies, said St. Gregory, by gentleness, win them over by forbearance, let them be punished by their own conscience, not by our wrath. Let us not at once wither the fig tree, from which a more skillful gardener may yet entice fruit. End of section 39 Recording by Todd Marchand Section 40 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmary Shea. May 10, St. Antoninus, Bishop. Antoninus, or Little Antony, as he was called from his small stature, was born in Florence in 1389. After a childhood of singular holiness, he begged to be admitted into the Dominican house at Fisole, but the superior, to test his sincerity and perseverance, told him he must first learn by heart the book of the Decretals, containing several hundred pages. This apparently impossible task was accomplished within twelve months, and Antoninus received the coveted habit in his sixteenth year. While still very young, he filled several important posts of his order, and was consulted on questions of difficulty by the most learned men of his day, being known for his wonderful prudence as the counsellor. He wrote several works on theology and history, and sat as papal theologian at the Council of Florence. In 1446 he was compelled to accept the archbishopric of that city, and in this dignity earned for himself the title of the Father of the Poor, for all he had was at their disposal. St. Antoninus never refused an alms which was asked in the name of God. When he had no money, he gave his clothes, shoes, or furniture. One day, being sent by the Florentines to the Pope, as he approached Rome, a beggar came up to him almost naked, and asked him for an alms for Christ's sake. Outdoing St. Martin, Antoninus gave him his whole cloak. When he entered the city, another was given him, by whom he knew not. His household consisted of only six persons, his palace contained no plate or costly furniture, and was often nearly destitute of the necessaries of life. His one mule was frequently sold for the relief of the poor, when it would be brought back to him by some wealthy citizen. He died embracing the crucifix, May 2, 1459, often repeating the words, To serve God is to reign. Reflection. Alms deeds, says St. Augustine, quote, comprise every kind of service rendered to our neighbor who needs such assistance. He who supports a lame man bestows an alms on him with his feet. 
he who guides a blind man does him a charity with his eyes he who carries an invalid or an old man upon his shoulders imparts to him an alms of his strength hence none are so poor but they may bestow an alms on the wealthiest man in the world End quote. End of section 40. Section 41 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmary Shea. May 11, St. Mamertus, Archbishop st mamertus archbishop of vienne in dauphine was a prelate renowned for his sanctity learning and miracles he instituted in his diocese the fasts and supplications called the rogations on the following occasions almighty god to punish the sins of the people visited them with wars and other public calamities and awakened them from their spiritual lethargy by the terrors of earthquakes fires and ravenous wild beasts which last were sometimes seen in the very market-place of cities these evils the impious ascribed to blind chance but religious and prudent persons considered them as tokens of the divine anger which threatened their entire destruction amidst these scourges st mamertus received a token of the divine mercy a terrible fire happened in the city of vienne which baffled the efforts of men but by the prayers of the good bishop the fire on a sudden went out this miracle strongly affected the minds of the people the holy prelate took this opportunity to make them sensible of the necessity and efficacy of devout prayer and formed a pious design of instituting an annual fast and supplication of three days in which all the faithful should join with sincere compunction of heart to appease the divine indignation by fasting prayer tears and the confession of sins the church of auvergne of which st sidonius was bishop adopted this pious institution before the year 475 and it became in a very short time a universal practice st mamertus died about the year 477 reflection know ye that the lord will hear your prayers if you continue with perseverance in fastings and prayers in the sight of the lord judith four eleven end of section forty one section forty two of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april to june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmary Shea. May 12. St. Epiphanius, Archbishop. St. Epiphanius was born about the year 310 in Palestine. In his youth, he began the study of the Holy Scriptures, embraced a monastic life, and went into egypt to perfect himself in the exercises of that state in the deserts of that country he returned to palestine about the year three thirty three and built a monastery near the place of his birth his labors in the exercise of virtue seemed to some to surpass his strength but his apology always was god gives not the kingdom of heaven but on condition that we labor and all we can do bears no proportion to such a crown to his corporal austerities he added an indefatigable application to prayer and study most books then in vogue passed through his hands and he improved himself very much in learning by his travels into many parts although the skilful director of many others saint epiphanius took the great saint hilarion as his master in a spiritual life and enjoyed the happiness of his direction and intimate acquaintance from the year 333 to 356. The reputation of his virtue made St. Epiphanius known to distant countries, and about the year 367 he was chosen as Bishop of Salamis in Cyprus. 
but he still wore the monastic habit and continued to govern his monastery in palestine which he visited from time to time he sometimes relaxed his austerities in favor of hospitality preferring charity to abstinence no one surpassed him in tenderness and charity to the poor the veneration which all men had for his sanctity exempted him from the persecution of the arian emperor valens in 376 he undertook a journey to antioch in the hopes of converting vitalis the apollinarist bishop and in 382 he accompanied saint paulinus from that city to rome where they lodged at the house of saint paula our saint in return entertained her afterward ten days in cyprus in 385 the very name of an error in faith or the shadow of danger of evil affrighted him and the saint fell into some mistakes on certain occasions which proceeded from zeal and simplicity he was on his way back to salamis after a short absence when he died in 403 having been bishop 36 years reflection quote, in this is charity not as though we had loved god but because he hath first loved us End of section 42section forty three of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april to june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april to june by john gilmary shea may thirteen saint john the silent john was born of a noble family at nicopolis in armenia in the year 454 but he derived from the virtue of his parents a much more illustrious nobility than that of their pedigree after their death he built at nicopolis a church in honor of the blessed virgin as also a monastery in which with ten fervent companions he shut himself up when only eighteen years of age with a view of making the salvation and most perfect sanctification of his soul his only and earnest pursuit not only to shun the danger of sin by the tongue but also out of sincere humility and contempt of himself and the love of interior recollection and prayer he very seldom spoke and when obliged to it was always in a very few words and with great discretion to his extreme affliction when he was only twenty-eight years old the archbishop of sebaste obliged him to quit his retreat and ordained him bishop of colonian in armenia in 482 in this dignity john preserved always the same spirit and as much as was compatible with the duties of his charge continued his monastic austerities and exercises whilst he was watching one night in prayer he saw before him a bright cross formed in the air and heard a voice which said to him if thou desirest to be saved follow this light it seemed to move before him and at length point out to the monastery of saint sabbas being satisfied what the sacrifice was which god required at his hands he found means to abdicate the episcopal charge and retired to the neighboring monastery of saint sabbas which at that time contained one hundred fifty fervent monks st john was then thirty-eight years old after living there unknown for some years fetching water carrying stones and doing other menial work st sabbas judging him worthy to be promoted to the priesthood presented him to the patriarch elias st john took the patriarch aside and having obtained from him a promise of secrecy said father i have been ordained bishop but on account of the multitude of my sins have fled and am come into this desert to await the visit of the lord the patriarch was startled but god revealed to saint sabbas the state of the affair whereupon calling for john he complained to him of his unkindness in concealing the matter from him finding himself discovered john wished to quit the monastery nor could saint sabbas prevail on him to stay but on a promise never to divulge the secret in the year 503 saint john withdrew into a neighboring wilderness but in 510 went back to the monastery 
and confined himself for forty years to his cell st john by his example and counsels conducted many fervent souls to god and continued to emulate as much as this mortal state will allow the glorious employment of the heavenly spirits in an uninterrupted exercise of love and praise till he passed to their blessed company soon after the year five fifty eight having lived seventy-six years in the desert which had only been interrupted by the nine years of his episcopal dignity reflection a love of christian silence is a proof that a soul makes it her chiefest delight to be occupied in god and finds no comfort like that of conversing with him this is the paradise of all devout souls End of section 43section 44 of little pictorial lives of the saints volume 2 april to june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org little pictorial lives of the saints volume 2 april to june by john gilmary shea may 14 saint pacomius abbot in the beginning of the fourth century great levies of troops were made throughout egypt for the service of the roman emperor among the recruits was pacomius a young heathen then in his twenty-first year on his way down the nile he passed a village whose inhabitants gave him food and money marvelling at this kindness pacomius was told they were christians and hoped for a reward in the life to come he then prayed god to show him the truth and promised to devote his life to his service on being discharged he returned to a christian village in egypt where he was instructed and baptized instead of going home he sought palamon an aged solitary to learn from him a perfect life and with great joy embraced the most severe austerities their food was bread and water once a day in summer and once in two days in winter sometimes they added herbs but mixed ashes with them they only kept one hour each night and this short repose pacomius took sitting upright without support three times god revealed to him that he was to found a religious order at tabena and an angel gave him a rule of life trusting in god he built a monastery although he had no disciples but vast multitudes soon flocked to him and he trained them in perfect detachment from creatures and from self one day a monk by dint of great exertions contrived to make two mats instead of the one which was the usual daily task and set them both out in front of his cell that pacomius might see how diligent he had been but the saint perceiving the vain glory which had prompted the act said this brother has taken a great deal of pains from morning till night to give his work to the devil then to cure him of his delusion pacomius imposed on him as a penance to keep his cell for five months and to taste no food but bread and water his visions and miracles were innumerable and he read all hearts his holy death occurred in three forty eight reflection to live in great simplicity said saint pacomius and in a wise ignorance is exceeding wise end of section forty four section forty five of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april to june this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Bielka. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by Jean Gilmari Shea. May 15th. Saints Peter and Dionysia. In the Decian persecution, the blood of the Christians flowed at Lampascus, a city of Asia Minor. St. Peter was the first who was led before the proconsul and condemned to die for the name of Christ. 
Young though he was, he went joyfully to his torments. He was bound to a wheel by iron chains, and his bones were broken, but he raised his eyes to heaven with a smiling countenance and said, I give thee thanks, O Lord Jesus Christ, because thou hast given me patience and made me victorious over the tyrant. The proconsul saw how little suffering availed and ordered the martyr to be beheaded. But a little later, in the same city, the virgin Dionysia showed a like eagerness to suffer. St. Dionysia gained the crown which an apostate lost, and his history may teach us that those who lose Christ rather than suffer with him lose all. With the strength that was left, he cried out, I never was a Christian! I sacrificed to the gods! Therefore, he was taken down, and he offered sacrifice. But he was possessed by the devil, whom he had chosen for his master. He fell to the earth in a fit, bit out his tongue, and so expired. He escaped a little pain, and instead he went to the endless torments of hell and forfeited eternal rest. Oh, wretched man, Dionysia cried, why have you feared a little suffering and chosen eternal pain instead? She was seized and led away to horrible outrage, but her angel guardian appeared by her side and protected the spouse of Christ. Escaping from prison, she still burned with the desire to be dissolved and to be with Christ. She threw herself upon the bodies of the martyrs, saying, I would fain die with you on earth, that I may live with you in heaven. And Christ, who is the crown of virgins and the strength of martyrs, gave her the desire of her heart. Reflection The martyrs were even like us, with natures which shrank from suffering. They were patient under it, because they looked to the eternal recompense, and endured as seeing him who is invisible. End of section 45。n of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea. May 16th, St. John Nepomucin. St. John was born in answer to prayer, A.D. 1330, of poor parents at Nepomuc in Bohemia. In gratitude, they consecrated him to God, and his holy life as a priest led to his appointment as chaplain to the court of the emperor Wenceslas, where he converted numbers by his preaching and example. Amongst those who sought his advice was the empress, who suffered much from her husband's unfounded jealousy. St. John taught her to bear her cross with joy, but her piety only incensed the emperor, and he tried to extort her confessions from the saint. He threw St. John into a dungeon, but gained nothing. Then, inviting him to his palace, he promised him riches if he would yield, and threatened death if he refused. The saint was silent. He was racked and burnt with torches, but no words, save Jesus and Mary, fell from his lips. At last set free, he spent his time in preaching and preparing for the death he knew to be at hand. On Ascension Eve, May 16, Winchelas, after a final and fruitless attempt to move his constancy, ordered him to be cast into the river and that night the martyr's hands and feet were bound, and he was thrown from the bridge of Prague. As he died, a heavenly light shining on the water discovered the body, which was buried with the honors due to a saint. A few years later, Wenchelslas was deposed by his own subjects, and died an impenitent and miserable death. In 1618, the Calvinist and Hussite soldiers of the Protestant elector Frederick tried repeatedly to demolish the shrine of St. John at Prague, each attempt was miraculously frustrated, and once the persons engaged in the sacrilege, among whom was an Englishman, were killed on the spot. In 1620, the imperial troops recovered the town by a victory which was ascribed to the saint's intercession, 
as he was seen on the eve of the battle radiant with glory guarding the cathedral when his shrine was opened three hundred and thirty years after his decease the flesh had disappeared and one member alone remained incorrupt the tongue thus still in silence giving glory to god reflection st john who by his invincible sacramental silence won his crown teaches us to prefer torture and death to offending the creator with our tongue how many times each day do we forfeit grace and strength by sins of speech end of section forty six Section 47 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeanne Virai. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmari Shea. Section 47. May 17, St. Pascal Bailon. From a child, Pascal seems to have been marked out for the service of God, and amidst his daily labors he found time to instruct and evangelize the rude herdsmen who kept their flocks on the hills of Aragon. At the age of twenty-four he entered the Franciscan order, in which, however, he remained, from humility, a simple lay brother, and occupied himself by preference with the roughest and most servile tasks. He was distinguished by an ardent love and devotion to the blessed sacrament. He would spend hours on his knees before the tabernacle. Often he was raised from the ground in the fervor of his prayer, and there, from the very and eternal truth, he drew such stores of wisdom that, unlettered as he was, he was counted by all a master in theology and spiritual science. Shortly after his profession, he was called to Paris on business connected with his order. The journey was full of peril, owing to the hostility of the Huguenots, who were numerous at the time, in the south of France, and on four separate occasions Pascal was in imminent danger of death at the hands of the heretics. But it was not God's will that his servant should obtain the crown of martyrdom, which, though judging himself all unworthy of it, he so earnestly desired, and he returned in safety to his convent, where he died in the odour of sanctity, May 15th, 1592. As Pascal was watching his sheep on the mountainside, he heard the consecration bell ring out from a church in the valley below, where the villagers were assembled for mass. The saint fell on his knees when suddenly there stood before him an angel of God, bearing in his hands the sacred host and offering it for his adoration. Learn from this how pleasing to Jesus Christ are those who honor him in this great mystery of his love and how to them especially this promise is fulfilled. I will not leave you orphans, I will come unto you. John fourteen eighteen. Reflection St. Pascal teaches us never to suffer a day to pass without visiting Jesus in the narrow chamber where he, whom the heaven itself cannot contain, abides day and night for our sake. End of section 47 Section 48 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeanne Virai. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmari Shea. Section 48. May 18th, St. Venantius, Martyr. St. Venantius was born at Camerino in Italy, and at the age of fifteen was seized as a Christian and carried before a judge. As it was found impossible to shake his constancy, either by threats or promises, he was condemned to be scourged, but was miraculously saved by an angel. He was then burnt with torches and hung over a low fire that he might be suffocated by the smoke. The judge's secretary, admiring the steadfastness of the saint and seeing an angel robed in white, who trampled out the fire and again set free the youthful martyr, proclaimed his faith in Christ, was baptized with his whole family, and shortly after won the martyr's crown himself. 
Venantius was then carried before the governor, who, unable to make him renounce his faith, cast him into prison with an apostate who vainly strove to tempt him. The governor then ordered his teeth and jaws to be broken, and had him thrown into a furnace, from which the angel once more delivered him. The saint was again led before the judge, who at sight of him fell headlong from his seat and expired, crying, The God of Venantius is the true God, let us destroy our idols. This circumstance being told to the governor, he ordered Venantius to be thrown to the lions, but these brutes, forgetting their natural ferocity, crouched at the feet of the saint. Then, by order of the tyrant, the young martyr was dragged through a heap of brambles and thorns, but again God manifested the glory of his servant. The soldiers suffering from thirst, the saint knelt on a rock and signed it with a cross, when immediately a jet of clear, cool water spurted up from the spot. This miracle converted many of those who beheld it, whereupon the governor had Venantius and his converts beheaded together in the year 250. The bodies of these martyrs are kept in the church at Camerino, which bears the saint's name. Reflection Love of suffering marks the most perfect degree in the love of God. Our Lord himself was consumed with the desire to suffer, because he burnt with the love of God. We must begin with patience and detachment. At last we shall learn to love the sufferings which conform us to the passion of our Redeemer. End of section 48 Section 49 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeanne Vidai. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmari Shea. Section 49. May 19th, St. Peter Celestine. As a child, Peter had visions of our Blessed Lady and of the angels and saints. They encouraged him in his prayer and chided him when he fell into any fault. His mother, though only a poor widow, put him to school, feeling sure that he would one day be a saint. At the age of twenty, he left his home in Apulia to live in a mountain solitude. Here he passed three years, assaulted by the evil spirits and beset with temptations of the flesh, but consoled by angels' visits. After this, his seclusion was invaded by disciples, who refused to be sent away, and the rule of life which he gave them formed the foundation of the Celestine order. Angels assisted in the church which Peter built, unseen bells rang peals of surpassing sweetness, and heavenly music filled the sanctuary when he offered the holy sacrifice. Suddenly he found himself torn from his loved solitude by his election to the papal throne. Resistance was of no avail. He took the name of Celestine to remind him of the heaven he was leaving, and for which he sighed and was consecrated at Aquila. After a reign of four months, Peter summoned the cardinals to his presence and solemnly resigned his trust. St. Peter built himself a boarded cell in his palace and there continued his hermit's life, and when, lest his simplicity might be taken advantage of to distract the peace of the church, he was put under guard. He said, I desired nothing but a cell, and a cell they have given me. There he enjoyed his former loving intimacy with the saints and angels, and sang the divine praises almost continually. At length, on Whit Sunday, he told his guards he would die within the week, and immediately fell ill. He received the last sacraments, and the following Saturday, as he finished the concluding verse of Lauds, Let every spirit bless the Lord, he closed his eyes to this world and opened them to the vision of God. Reflection. Whoso, says the imitation of Christ, withdraweth himself from acquaintances and friends, to him will God draw near with his holy angels. End of section 49. Section 50 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, 
April to June by John Gilmari Shea. Section 50. May 20th, St. Bernardine of Siena. In 1408, St. Vincent Ferrer once suddenly interrupted his sermon to declare that there was among his hearers a young Franciscan who would be one day a greater preacher than himself and would be set before him in honour by the church. This unknown friar was Bernardine. Of noble birth, he had spent his youth in works of mercy and had then entered religion. Owing to a defective utterance, his success as a preacher at first seemed doubtful, but by the prayers of Our Lady, this obstacle was miraculously removed, and Bernardine began an apostolate which lasted thirty-eight years. By his burning words and by the power of the holy name of Jesus, which he displayed on a tablet at the end of his sermons, he obtained miraculous conversions and reformed the greater part of Italy. But this success had to be exalted by the cross. The saint was denounced as a heretic and his devotion as idolatrous. After many trials, he lived to see his innocence proved and a lasting memorial of his work established in a church. The Feast of the Holy Name commemorates at once his sufferings and his triumph. He died on Ascension Eve, 1444, while his brethren were chanting the antiphon, Father, I have manifested thy name to men. St. Bernardine, when a youth, undertook the charge of a holy old woman, a relation of his who had been left destitute. She was blind and bedridden, and during her long illness could only utter the holy name. The saint watched over her till she died, and thus learned the devotion of his life. Reflection Let us learn from the life of St. Bernardine the power of the holy name in life and death. End of section 50. Section 51 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmari Shea. Section 51. Saint Hospitius, Recluse. Saint Hospitius shut himself up in the ruins of an old tower near Villafranca, one league from Nice in Provence. He girded himself with a heavy iron chain and lived on bread and dates only. During Lent he redoubled his austerities and in order to conform his life more closely to that of the anchorites of Egypt, ate nothing but roots. For his great virtues, heaven honoured him with the gifts of prophecy and of miracles. He foretold the ravages which the Lombards would make in Gaul. These barbarians, having come to the tower in which Hospitius lived, and seeing the chain with which he was bound, mistook him for some criminal who was there imprisoned. On questioning the saint, he acknowledged he was a great sinner and unworthy to live. Whereupon one of the soldiers lifted his sword to strike him, but God did not desert his faithful servant. The soldier's arms stiffened and became numb, and it was not until Hospitius made the sign of the cross over it that the man recovered the use of it. The soldier embraced Christianity, renounced the world, and passed the rest of his days in serving God. When our saint felt that his last hour was nearing, he took off his chain and knelt in prayer for a long time. Then, stretching himself on a little bank of earth, he calmly gave up his soul to God on the 21st of May, 681. Reflection. If we do not love penitence for its own sake, let us love it on account of our sins, for we should work out our salvation in fear and trembling. End of section 51. Section 52 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmari Shea. May 22nd, St. Evo, Confessor. St. Evo Halori descended from a noble and virtuous family near Treguir in Brittany, was born in 1253. 
At 14 years of age, he went to Paris and afterwards to Orléans to pursue his studies. His mother was wont frequently to say to him that he ought so to live as become a saint, to which his answer always was that he hoped to become one. This resolution took deep root in his soul and was a continual spur to virtue and a check against the least shadow of any dangerous course. His time was chiefly divided between study and prayer. For his recreation, he visited the hospitals where he attended the sick with great charity and comforted them under the severe trials of their suffering condition. He made a private vow of perpetual chastity, but this was not being known. Many honorable matches were proposed to him, which he modestly rejected as incompatible with his studious life. He long deliberated whether to embrace a religious or a clerical state, but the desire of serving his neighbor determined him at length in favor of the latter. He wished, out of humility, to remain in the lesser orders, but his bishop compelled him to receive the priesthood a step which cost him many tears, though he had qualified himself for that sacred dignity by the most perfect purity of mind and body, and by a long and fervent preparation. He was appointed ecclesiastical judge for the Diocese of Rennes. St. Yuvaux protected the orphans and widows, defended the poor, and administered justice to all with impartiality, application, and tenderness which gained him the good will, even of those who lost their causes. He was surnamed the advocate and lawyer of the poor. He built a house near his own for a hospital of the poor and sick. He washed their feet, cleansed their ulcers, served them at table, and ate himself only the scraps which they had left. He distributed his corn, or the price for which he sold it, among the poor immediately after the harvest. When a certain person endeavored to persuade him to keep it some months, that he might sell it at a better price, he answered, I know not whether I shall be then alive to give it. Another time, the same person said to him, I have gained a fifth by keeping my corn. But I, replied the saint, a hundredth fold, by giving it immediately away. During the Lent of 1303, he felt his strength failing him. Yet, far from abating anything in his austerities, he thought himself obliged to redouble his fervor in proportion as he advanced nearer to eternity. On the eve of the ascension, he preached to his people, said Mass, being upheld by two persons, and gave advice to all who addressed themselves to him. After this, he lay down on his bed, which was a hurdle of twigs plaited together, and received the last sacraments. From that moment he entertained himself with God alone, till his soul went to possess him in his glory. His death happened on the 19th of May, 1303, in the fiftieth year of his age. Reflection. St. Evaux was a saint amidst the dangers of the world, but he preserved his virtue untainted only by arming himself carefully against them, by conversing assiduously with God in prayer and holy meditation, and by most watchfully shunning the snares of bad company. Without this precaution, all the instructions of parents and all other means of virtue are ineffectual, and the soul is sure to be split against this rock which does not steer wide of it. End of section 52。section 53 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brianna Childs. 
author Brianna Childs at Facebook.com. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmurray Shea. May 23, St. Julia, Virgin, Martyr. St. Julia was a noble virgin of Carthage who, when the city was taken by Genseric in 439, was sold for a slave to a pagan merchant of Syria named Eusebius. Under the most mortifying employments of her station, by cheerfulness and patience, she found a happiness and comfort which the world could not have afforded. All the time she was not employed in her master's business, was devoted to prayer and reading books of piety. Her master, who was charmed with her fidelity and other virtues, thought proper to carry her with him on one of his voyages to Gaul. Having reached the northern part of Corsica, he cast anchor and went on shore to join the pagans of the place in an idolatrous festival. Julia was left at some distance because she would not be defiled by the superstitious ceremonies which she openly reviled. Felix, the governor of the island, who was a bigoted pagan, asked who this woman was who dared to insult the gods. Eusebius informed him that she was a Christian and that all his authority over her was too weak to prevail with her to renounce her religion, but that he found her so diligent and faithful he could not part with her. The governor offered him four of his best female slaves in exchange for her, but the merchant replied, No, all you are worth will not purchase her, for I would freely lose the most valuable thing I have in the world rather than be deprived of her. However, the governor, while Eusebius was drunk and asleep, took upon him to compel her to sacrifice to his god. The saint made answer that she was as free as she desired to be as long as she was allowed to serve Jesus Christ. Felix, thinking himself derided by her undaunted, resolute air, in a transport of rage caused her to be struck on the face and the hair of her head to be torn off. And lastly, ordered her to be hanged on a cross till she expired. Certain monks of the Isle of Gorgon carried off her body. But in 763, Desiderius, king of Lombardy, removed her relics to Brescia, where her memory is celebrated with great devotion. Reflection St. Julia, whether free or slave, whether in prosperity or in adversity, was equally fervent and devout. She adored all the sweet designs of Providence, and far from complaining, she never ceased to praise and thank God under all his holy appointments, making them always the means of her virtue and sanctification. God, by an admirable chain of events, raised her by his fidelity to the honor of the saints and to the dignity of a virgin and martyr. End of section 53. Section 54 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laurie Arsenault Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea May 24, Saints Donation and Rogation, Martyrs There lived at Nantes an illustrious young nobleman named Donation, who, having received the Holy Sacrament of Regeneration, led a most edifying life, and strove with much zeal to convert others to faith in Christ. His elder brother, Rogation, was not able to resist the moving example of his piety and the force of his discourses, and desired to be baptized. But the bishop, having withdrawn and concealed himself for fear of the persecution, he was not able to receive that sacrament, but was shortly after 
baptized in his blood, for he declared himself a Christian at a time when to embrace that sacred profession was to become a candidate for martyrdom. Donation was impeached for professing himself a Christian, and for having withdrawn others, particularly his brother, from the worship of the gods. Donation was therefore apprehended, and having boldly confessed Christ before the governor, was cast into prison and loaded with irons. Rogation was also brought before the prefect, who endeavored first to gain him by flattering speeches, but finding him inflexible, sent him to prison with his brother. Rogation grieved that he had not been able to receive the sacrament of baptism, and prayed that the kiss of peace which his brother gave him might supply it. Donation also prayed for him that his faith might procure for him the effect of baptism, and the effusion of his blood, that of the sacrament of confirmation. They passed that night together in fervent prayer. They were the next day called for again by the prefect, to whom they declared that they were ready to suffer for the name of Christ, whatever torments were prepared for them. By the order of the inhuman judge, they were first stretched on the rack, afterwards their heads were pierced with lances, and lastly cut off about the year 287. Reflection Three things are pleasing unto God and man. Conquered among brethren, the love of parents, and the union of man and wife. End of section 54 Recording by Lori Arsenault Section 55 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Bryan Stewart. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April June, by John Gilmore Shea. May 25th, St. Gregory the Seventh. Gregory the Seventh, by name Hildebrand, was born in Tuscany about the year 1013. He was educated in Rome. From thence, he went to France and became a monk at Cluny. Afterwards, he returned to Rome, and for many years filled high trust of the Holy See. Three great evils then afflicted the church. Simony, concubinage, and the custom of receiving a vestiture from lay hands. Against these three corruptions, Gregory never ceased to contend. As legate of Victor II, he held a council at Lyons, where Simony was condemned. He was elected Pope in 1073, and at once called upon the pastors of the Catholic world to lay down their lives, rather than betray the laws of God to the will of princes. Rome was in rebellion through the ambition of Cenci. Gregory excommunicated them. They laid hands on him at Christmas during the Midnight Mass, wounded him, and cast him into prison. The following day he was rescued by the people. Next arose his conflict with Henry IV, Emperor of Germany. This monarch, after openly relapsing into simony, pretended to depose the Pope. Gregory excommunicated the emperor. His subjects turned against him, and at last he sought absolution of Gregory at Canossa. But he did not persevere. He set up an antipope and besieged Gregory in the castle of St. Angelo. The aged pontiff was obliged to flee, and on May 25, 1085, about the 72nd year of his life and the 12th year of his pontiff, Gregory entered into his rest. His last words were full of a divine wisdom and patience. As he was dying, he said, I have loved justice and hated iniquity. Therefore, I die in exile. His faithful attendant answered, Vicar of Christ, an exile thou canst never be, 
For to thee God has given the Gentiles for an inheritance, and the utmost ends of the earth for thy possession. Reflection Eight hundred years are past since St. Gregory died, and we see the same conflict renewed before our eyes. Let us learn from him to suffer any persecution from the world or the state, rather than to betray the rights of the Holy See. End of section 55「Section 56 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea. May 26, St. Philip, Neri. Philip was one of the noble line of saints raised up by God in the 16th century to console and bless his church. After a childhood of angelic beauty, the Holy Spirit drew him away from Florence, the place of his birth, showed him the world that he might freely renounce it, led him to Rome, modeled him in mind and heart and will, and then, as by a second Pentecost, came down in visible form and filled his soul with light and peace and joy. He would have gone to India, but God reserved him for Rome. There he went on simply from day to day, drawing souls to Jesus, exercising them in mortification and charity, and binding them together by cheerful devotions, thus unconsciously to himself, under the hands of Mary, as he said, the oratory grew up, and all Rome was pervaded and transformed by his spirit. His life was a continuous miracle his habitual state in ecstasy. He read the hearts of men, foretold their future, knew their eternal destiny. His touch gave health of body. His very look calmed souls in trouble and drove away temptations. He was gay, genial, and irresistibly winning. Neither insult nor wrong could dim the brightness of his joy. Philip lived in an atmosphere of sunshine and gladness which brightened all who came near him. When I met him in the street, says one, he would pat my cheek and say, Well, how is Don Pellegrino? And leave me so full of joy that I could not tell which way I was going. Others say that when he playfully pulled their hair or their ears, their hearts would bound with joy. Marcio Altieri felt such overflowing gladness in his presence that he said Philip's room was a paradise on earth. Fabrizio de Massimi would go in sadness or perplexity and stand at philip's door he said it was enough to see him to be near him and long after his death it was enough for many when troubled to go into his room to find their hearts lightened and gladdened he inspired a boundless confidence and love and was the common refuge and consoler of all a gentle jest would convey his rebukes and veil his miracles the highest honors sought him out but he put them from him. He died in his eightieth year, A.D. 1595, and bears the grand title of Apostle of Rome. Reflection Philip wished his children to serve God like the first Christians, in gladness of heart. He said this was the true filial spirit. This expands the soul, giving it liberty and perfection in action, power over temptations, and fuller aid to perseverance. St. Augustine, Apostle of England. Augustine was prior of the monastery of St. Andrew on the Colian, and was appointed by St. Gregory, the great chief of the missionaries whom he sent to England. St. Augustine and his companions, having heard on their journeys many reports of the barbarism and ferocity of the pagan English, were afraid and wished to turn back. But St. Gregory replied, Go on in God's name. The greater your hardships, the greater your crown. May the grace of Almighty God protect you, and give me to see the fruit of your labor in the heavenly country. If I cannot share your toil, I shall yet share the harvest, for God knows that it is not good will which is wanting. The band of missionaries went off in obedience. Landing at Ebbsfleet between Sandwich and Ramsgate, they met King Ethelbert and his thanes under a great oak tree at Minster, and announced to him the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
instant and complete success attended their preaching on whit sunday five ninety six king ethelbert was baptized and his example was followed by the greater number of his nobles and people by degrees the faith spread far and wide and augustine as papal legate set out on a visitation of britain he failed in his attempt to enlist the britons of the west in the work of his apostolate through their obstinate jealousy and pride but his success was triumphant from south to north st augustine died after eight years of evangelical labors the anglo-saxon church which he founded is still famous for its learning zeal and devotion to the holy see while its calendar commemorates no less than three hundred saints half of whom were of royal birth reflection the work of an apostle is the work of the right hand of god he often chooses weak instruments for his mightiest purposes the most sure augury of lasting success in missionary labor is obedience to superiors and diffidence in self End of section fifty six section fifty seven of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june by john gilmary shea may twenty seventh st mary magdalene of Pazzi st mary magdalene of Pazzi, of an illustrious house in florence was born in the year fifteen sixty six and baptized by the name of catherine she received her first communion at ten years of age and made a vow of virginity at twelve she took great pleasure in carefully teaching the christian doctrine to the ignorant her father not knowing her vow wished to give her in marriage but she persuaded him to allow her to become a religious was more difficult to obtain her mother's consent but at last she gained it and she was professed being then eighteen years of age in the carmelite monastery of santa maria degli angeli in florence may seventeenth fifteen eighty four she changed her name catherine into that of mary magdalene on becoming a nun and took as her motto to suffer or die and her life henceforth was a life of penance for sins not her own and of love of our lord who tried her in ways fearful and strange she was obedient observant of the rule humble and mortified and had a great reverence for the religious life she loved poverty and suffering and hungered after communion the day of communion she called the day of love the charity that burned in her heart led her in her youth to choose the house of the carmelites because the religious therein communicated every day she rejoiced to see others communicate even when she was not allowed to do so herself and her love for her sisters grew when she saw them receive our lord god raised her to high states of prayer and gave her rare gifts enabling her to read the thoughts of her novices and filling her with wisdom to direct them aright she was twice chosen mistress of novices and then made superioress when god took her to himself may twenty fifth sixteen o seven her body was incorrupt reflection st mary magdalene of Pazzi was so filled with the love of god that her sisters in the monastery observed in it her love of themselves and called her the mother of charity and the charity of the monastery venerable bede the illustrious ornament of the anglo-saxon church and the first english historian was consecrated to god at the age of seven and entrusted to the care of st benedict biscoff at weirmouth he became a monk in the sister house of Jarrow, and there trained no less than six hundred scholars whom his piety learning and sweet disposition had gathered round him to the toils of teaching and the exact observance of his rule he added long hours of private prayer and the study of every branch of science and literature then known he was familiar with latin greek and hebrew in the treatise which he compiled for his scholars still extant he threw together all that the world had then stored in history chronology physics music philosophy poetry arithmetic and medicine in his ecclesiastical history he has left us beautiful lives of 
anglo-saxon saints and holy fathers while his commentaries on the holy scriptures are still in use by the church it was to the study of the divine word that he devoted the whole energy of his soul and at times his compunction was so overpowering that his voice would break with weeping while the tears of his scholars mingled with his own he had little aid from others and during his later years suffered from constant illness yet he worked and prayed up to his last hour the saint was employed in translating the gospel of st john from the greek up to the hour of his death which took place on ascension day a d seven thirty five he spent that day joyfully writes one of his scholars and in the evening the boy who attended him said dear master there is yet one sentence unwritten and he answered write it quickly presently the youth said now it is written he replied good thou hast said the truth consummatum est take my head into your hands for it is very pleasant to me to sit facing my old praying place and there to call upon my father and so on the floor of his cell he sang glory be to the father son and holy ghost and just as he said holy ghost he breathed his last and went to the realms above reflection the more says the imitation of christ a man is united within himself and interiorly simple so much the more in deeper things doth he understand without labour for he receiveth the light of understanding from on high End of section fifty seven section fifty eight of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june by john gilmary shea may twenty eighth st germanus bishop st germanus the glory of the church of france in the sixth century was born in the territory of atun about the year four sixty nine in his youth he was conspicuous for his fervour being ordained priest he was made abbot of st symphorians he was favoured at that time with the gifts of miracles and prophecy it was his custom to watch the great part of the night in the church in prayer whilst his monks slept one night in a dream he thought a venerable old man presented him with the keys of the city of paris and said to him that god committed to his care the inhabitants of that city that he should save them from perishing four years after this divine admonition in five fifty four happening to be at paris when that see became vacant on the demise of the bishop eusebius he was exalted to the episcopal chair though he endeavoured by many tears to decline the charge his promotion made no alteration in his mode of life the same simplicity and frugality appeared in his dress table and furniture his house was perpetually crowded with the poor and the afflicted and he had always many beggars at his own table god gave to his sermons a wonderful influence over the minds of all ranks of people so that the face of the whole city was in a very short time quite changed king childebert who till then had been an ambitious worldly prince was entirely converted by the sweetness and the powerful discourses of the saint and founded many religious institutions and sent large sums of money to the good bishop to be distributed among the indigent in his old age st germanus lost nothing of that zeal and activity with which he had filled the great duties of his station and the vigour of his life nor did the weakness to which his corporal austerities had reduced him made him abate anything in the mortifications of his penitential life in which he redoubled his fervour as he approached nearer to the end of his course by his zeal the remains of idolatry were extirpated in france the saint continued his labours for the conversion of sinners till he was called to receive the reward of them on the twenty eighth of may five seventy six being eighty years old reflection in the churches bless ye god the lord from thy temple kings shall offer presents to thee end of section fifty eight Section 59 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, 
April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea. May 29th, St. Cyril, Martyr. St. Cyril suffered while still a boy at Caesarea in Cappadocia during the persecutions of the third century. He used to repeat the name of Christ at all times and confess that the mere utterance of this name moved him strangely. He was beaten and reviled by his heathen father, but he bore all this with joy, increasing in the strength of Christ who dwelt within him and drawing many of his own age to the imitation of his heavenly life. When his father in his fury turned him out of doors, he said he had lost little and would receive a great recompense instead. Soon after, he was brought before the magistrate on account of his faith. No threats could make him show a sign of fear, and the judge, pitying perhaps his tender years, offered him his freedom, assured him of his father's forgiveness, and besought him to return to his home and inheritance. But the blessed youth replied, I left my home gladly, for I have a greater and a better which is waiting for me. He was filled with the same heavenly desires to the end. He was taken to the fire as if for execution, and was then brought back and re-examined, but he only protested against the cruel delay. Let out to die, he hurried on the executioners, gazed unmoved at the flames which were kindled for him, and expired, hastening, as he said, to his home reflection ask our lord to make all earthly joy insipid and to fill you with a constant desire of heaven this desire will make labor easy and suffering light will make you fervent and detached and bring you even here a foretaste of that eternal joy and peace to which you are hastening end of section fifty nine section sixty of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea. May 30th, St. Felix I, Pope and Martyr. St. Felix was a Roman by birth and seceded St. Dionysus in the government of the church in 269. Paul of Samosata, the proud Archbishop of Antioch, to the guilt of many enormous crimes, added that of heresy, teaching that Christ was no more than a mere man in whom the divine word dwelt by its operation, and as in its temple with many other gross errors concerning the capital mysteries of the Trinity and Incarnation. Three councils were held at Antioch to examine his cause, and in the third assembled in 269, being clearly convicted of heresy, pride, and many scandalous crimes, he was excommunicated and deposed, and Domnus was substituted in his place. As Paul still kept possession of the Episcopal house, our saint had recourse to the emperor Aurelian, who, though a pagan, gave an order that the house should belong to him to whom the bishops of Rome and Italy had judged it. The persecution of Aurelian breaking out, St. Felix, fearless of danger, strengthened the weak, encouraged all, baptized the catechumens, and continued to exert himself in converting infidels to the faith. He himself obtained the glory of martyrdom. He governed the church five years and passed to a glorious eternity in 274. Reflection the example of our Saviour and of all his saints ought to encourage us under all trials to suffer with patience and even joy. We shall soon begin to feel that it is sweet to tread in the steps of a God-man, and shall find that if we courageously take up our crosses, he will make them light by sharing the burden with us. End of section 60 Section 61 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea. May 31st, St. Petronilla, Virgin. Among the disciples of the apostles in the primitive age of saints, this holy virgin shone as a bright star in the church. She lived when Christians were more solicitous to live well than to write much. They knew how to die for Christ, but did not compile long books in which vanity has often a greater share than charity. Hence no particular account of her actions has been handed down to us. But how eminent her sanctity was, we may judge from the luster by which it was distinguished among apostles, prophets, and martyrs. She is said to have been a daughter of the apostle St. Peter, that St. Peter was married before his vocation to the apostleship, we learn from the gospel. St. Clement of Alexandria assures us that his wife attained to the glory of martyrdom, at which Peter himself encouraged her, bidding her to remember our Lord. But it seems not certain whether St. Petronilla was more than the spiritual daughter of that apostle. She flourished at Rome and was buried on the way to Ardea, where in ancient times a cemetery and a church bore her name. Reflection With the saints, the great end for which they lived was always present to their minds, and they thought every moment lost in which they did not make some advances toward eternal bliss. How will their example condemn at the last day the trifling fooleries in the greatest part of the conversation and employments of the world, which aim at nothing but present amusements, and forget the only important affair, the business of eternity? End of section 61section sixty two of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june by john gilmary shea june first st justin martyr St. Justin was born of heathen parents at Neapolis in Samaria, about the year 103. He was well educated and gave himself to the study of philosophy, but always with one object, that he might learn the knowledge of God. He sought this knowledge among the contending schools of philosophy, but always in vain, till at last God himself appeased the thirst which he had created. One day, while Justin was walking by the seashore, meditating on the thought of God, an old man met him and questioned him on the subject of his doubts, and when he had made Justin confess that the philosophers taught nothing certain about God, he told him of the writings of the inspired prophets and of Jesus Christ, whom they announced, and bade him seek light and understanding through prayer. The scriptures and the constancy of the Christian martyrs led Justin from the darkness of human reason to the light of faith. In his zeal for the faith, he traveled to Greece, Egypt, and Italy, gaining many to Christ. At Rome he sealed his testimony with his blood, surrounded by his disciples. Do you think, the prefect said to Justin, that by dying you will enter heaven and be rewarded by God? I do not think, was the saint's answer. I know. Then as now there were many religious opinions, but only one certainty, the certainty of the Catholic faith. This certainty should be the measure of our confidence and our zeal. Reflection we have received the gift of faith with little labor of our own. Let us learn how to value it from those who reached it after long search and lived in the misery of a world which did not know God. Let us fear, as St. Justin did, the account we shall have to render for the gift of God. St. Pamphilus, Martyr St. Pamphilus was of a rich and honorable family, and a native of Beritus, in which city at that time famous for its schools, he in his youth ran through the whole circle of the sciences, was afterward honored with the first employments of the magistrate. After he began to know Christ, he could relish no other study but that of salvation, and renounced everything else that he might apply himself wholly to the exercises of virtue and the studies of the holy scriptures. This accomplished master in profane sciences and this renowned magistrate was not ashamed to become the humble scholar of Pierius, the successor of Origen and the great catechetical school of Alexandria. 
he afterward made caesarea and palestine his residence where at his private expense he collected a great library which he bestowed on the church of that city the saint established there also a public school of sacred literature and to his labors the church was indebted for a most correct edition of the holy bible which with infinite care he transcribed himself but nothing was more remarkable in the saint than his extraordinary humility his paternal estate he at length distributed among the poor towards his slaves and domestics his behavior was always that of a brother or a tender father he led a most austere life sequestered from the world and its company and was indefatigable in labor such a virtue was his apprenticeship to the grace of martyrdom in the year three o seven urbanus the cruel governor of palestine caused him to be apprehended and commanded him to be most inhumanly tormented but the iron hooks which tore the martyr's sides served only to cover the judge with confusion after this the saint remained almost two years in prison urbanus the governor was himself beheaded by an order of the emperor maximinus but was succeeded by Firmilian, a man not less barbarous than bigoted and superstitious after several butcheries he caused st pamphilius to be brought before him and passed sentence of death upon him his flesh was torn off to the very bones and his bowels exposed to view and the torments were continued a long time without intermission but he never once opened his mouth so much as to groan he finished his martyrdom by a slow fire and died invoking jesus the son of god reflection a cloud of witnesses a noble army of martyrs teach us by their constancy to suffer wrong with patience and strenuously to resist evil the daily trials we meet with from others or from ourselves are always sent us by god who sometimes throws difficulties in our way on purpose to reward our conquest and sometimes like a wise physician restores us to our health by bitter potions End of section 62. Section 63 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June by john gilmary shea june second st pothinus bishop sanctus attalus blandina and other martyrs of lyon after the miraculous victory obtained by the prayers of the christians under marcus aurelius in one seventy four the church enjoyed a kind of peace though it was often disturbed in particular places by popular commotions or by the superstitious fury of certain governors this appears from the violent persecution which was raised three years after the aforesaid victory at Vion and Lyon in 177, whilst St. Pothinus was bishop of Lyon and St. Irenus, who had been sent thither by St. Polycarp out of Asia, was a priest of that city. Many of the principal Christians were brought before the Roman governor. Among them was a slave, Blandina, and her mistress also a christian feared that blandina lacked strength to brave the torture she was tormented a whole day through but she bore it all with joy till the executioners gave up confessing themselves outdone red-hot plates were held to the sides of sanctus a deacon of Vion, till his body became one great sore and he looked no longer like a man but in the midst of his tortures he was bedewed and strengthened by the stream of heavenly water which flows from the side of christ meanwhile many confessors were kept in prison and with them were some who had been terrified into apostasy even the heathens marked the joy of martyrdom in the christians who were decked for their eternal espousals and the misery of the apostates but the faithful confessors brought back those who had fallen and the church that virgin mother rejoiced when she saw her children live again in christ some died in prison the rest were martyred one by one st blandina last of all after seeing her younger brother put to a cruel death and encouraging him to victory reflection in early times the christians were called the children of joy let us seek the joy of the holy spirit to sweeten suffering 
to temper earthly delight till we enter into the joy of our lord end of section sixty three section sixty four of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june by john gilmary shea june third st clotilda queen st clotilda was daughter of chilperic younger brother to gondibald the tyrannical king of burgundy who put him and his wife and his other brothers except one to death in order to usurp their dominions clotilda was brought up in her uncle's court and by a singular providence was instructed in the catholic religion though she was educated in the midst of arians her wit beauty meekness modesty and piety made her the adoration of all the neighboring kingdoms and clovis i surnamed the great the victorious king of the franks demanded and obtained her in marriage she honored her royal husband studied to sweeten the warlike temper by christian meekness conformed herself to his humor in things that were indifferent and the better to gain his affections made those things the subject of her discourse and praises in which she knew him to take the greatest delight when she saw herself mistress of his heart she did not defer the great work of endeavoring to win him to god but the fear of giving offence to his people made him delay his conversion his miraculous victory over the almani and his entire conversion in four ninety six were at length the fruit of our saint's prayers clotilda having gained to god this great monarch never ceased to excite him to glorious actions for the divine honor among other religious foundations he built in paris at her request about the year five eleven the great church of saints peter and paul now called st genevieve's this great prince died on the twenty seventh of november in the year five eleven at the age of forty-five having reigned thirty-five years his eldest son theodoric reigned at rheims over the eastern parts of france clotomir reigned at orleans and childebert at paris and clotaire the first at Soissons. this division meant wars and mutual jealousies till in five sixty the whole monarchy was reunited under clotaire the youngest of these brothers the dissension in her family contributed more perfectly to wean clotilda's heart from the world she spent the remaining part of her life in exercises of prayer alms deeds watching fasting and penance seeming totally to forget she had been queen or that her son sat on the throne eternity filled her heart and employed all her thoughts she foretold her death thirty days before it happened on the thirtieth day of her illness she received the sacraments made a public confession of her faith and departed to the lord on the third of june in five forty five reflection st peter defines the mission of the christian woman to win the heart of those who believe not the word End of section 64. Section 65 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June by john gilmary shea june four st francis caracciolo francis was born in the kingdom of naples of the princely family of caracciolo in childhood he shunned all amusements recited the rosary regularly and loved to visit the blessed sacrament and to distribute his food to the poor an attack of leprosy taught him the vileness of the human body and the vanity of the world almost miraculously cured he renounced his home to study for the priesthood at naples where he spent his leisure hours in the prisons or visiting the blessed sacrament in unfrequented churches god called him when only twenty-five to found an order of clerks regular whose rule was that each day one father fasted on bread and water another took the discipline 
a third wore a hair shirt while they always watched by turns in perpetual adoration before the blessed sacrament they took the usual vows adding a fourth not to desire dignities to establish his order francis undertook many journeys through italy and spain on foot and without money content with the shelter and crust given him in charity being elected general he redoubled his austerities and devoted seven hours daily to meditation on the passion besides passing most of the night praying before the blessed sacrament francis was commonly called the preacher of divine love but it was before the blessed sacrament that his ardent devotion was most clearly perceptible in presence of his divine lord his face usually emitted brilliant rays of light and he often bathed the ground with his tears when he prayed according to his custom prostrate on his face before the tabernacle and constantly repeating as one devoured by internal fire the zeal of thy house hath eaten me up he died of fever aged forty-four on the eve of corpus christi sixteen o eight saying let us go let us go to heaven when his body was opened after death his heart was found as if it were burnt up and these words imprinted around it zealous domus tue cometi me the zeal of thy house hath eaten me up reflection it is for men and not for angels that our blessed lord resides upon the altar yet angels throng our churches to worship him while men desert him learn from st francis to avoid such ingratitude and to spend as he did every possible moment before the most holy sacrament end of section sixty five section sixty six of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june by john gilmary shea june fifth st boniface bishop martyr st boniface was born at cretadon in devonshire england in the year six eighty some missionaries staying at his father's house spoke to him of heavenly things and inspired him with a wish to devote himself as they did to god he entered the monastery of exminster and was there trained for his apostolic work his first attempt to convert the pagans in holland having failed he went to rome to obtain the pope's blessing on his mission and returned with authority to preach to the german tribes it was a slow and dangerous task his own life was in constant peril while his flock was often reduced to abject poverty by the wandering robber bands yet his courage never flagged he began with bavaria and thuringia next visit friesland then passed on to hesse and saxony everywhere destroying the idle temples and raising churches on their site he endeavored as far as possible to make every object of idolatry contribute in some way to the glory of god on one occasion having cut down an immense oak which was consecrated to jupiter he used the tree in building a church which he dedicated to the prince of the apostles he was now recalled to rome consecrated bishop by the pope and returned to extend and organize the rising german church with diligent care he reformed abuses among the existing clergy and established religious houses throughout the land at length feeling his infirmities increase and fearful of losing his martyr's crown boniface appointed a successor to the monastery and set out to convert a fresh pagan tribe while st boniface was waiting to administer confirmation to some newly baptized christians a troop of pagans arrived armed with swords and spears his attendants would have opposed him but the saint said to his followers my children cease your resistance the long expected day has come at last scripture forbids us to resist evil let us put our hope in god he will save our souls scarcely had he ceased speaking when the barbarians fell upon him and slew him with all his attendants to the number of fifty-two reflection st boniface teaches us how the love of christ changes all things 
it was for christ's sake that he toiled for souls preferring poverty to riches labor to rest suffering to pleasure death to life that by dying he might live with christ end of section sixty six section sixty seven of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april to june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Bielka. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by Jean Gilmari Shea. June 6. St. Norbert, Bishop. Of noble rank and rare talents, Norbert passed a most pious youth and entered the ecclesiastical state. By a strange contradiction, his conduct now became a scandal to his sacred calling and at the court of the emperor henry the fourth he led like many clerics of that age a life of dissipation and luxury one day when he was thirty years of age he was thrown half dead from his horse and on recovering his senses resolved upon a new life after a severe and searching preparation he was ordained priest and began to expose the abuses of his order Silenced at first by a local council, he obtained the Pope's sanction and preached penance to listening crowds in France and the Netherlands. In the wild vale of Primontaire, he gave to some trained disciples the rule of St. Austin and a white habit to denote the angelic purity proper to the priesthood. The canons regular, or Primonstratensions, as they were called, were to unite the active work of the country clergy with the obligations of the monastic life. Their fervor renewed the spirit of the priesthood, quickened the faith of the people, and drove out heresy. A vile heretic named Tanklin appeared at Antwerp in the time of St. Norbert and denied the reality of the priesthood and especially blasphemed the blessed Eucharist. The saint was sent for to drive out the pest. By his burning words, he exposed the impostor and rekindled the faith in the blessed sacrament. Many of the apostates had proved their contempt for the blessed sacrament by burying it in filthy places. St. Norbert bade them search for the sacred hosts. They found them entire and uninjured, and the saint bore them back in triumph. To the tabernacle. Hence he is generally painted with the monstrance in his hand. In 1126, St. Norbert found himself appointed Bishop of Magdeburg, and there, at the risk of his life, he zealously carried on his work of reform, and died, worn out with toil, at the age of fifty-three. Reflection Reparation for the injuries offered to the Blessed Sacrament was the aim of St. Norbert's great work, of reform in himself, in the clergy, and in the faithful. How much does our present worship repair for our own past irreverences and for the outrages offered by others to the Blessed Eucharist? End of section 67 Section 68 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmari Shea. June 7th, St. Robert of Newminster. In 1132, Robert was a monk at Whitby, England, when news arrived that 13 religious had been violently expelled from the Abbey of St. Mary in York for having proposed to restore the strict Benedictine rule. He at once set out to join them, and found them on the banks of the Skeld near Ripon, living in the midst of winter, in a hut made of hurdles and roofed with turf. In the spring, they affiliated themselves to St. Bernard's Reform at Clairvoy, and for two years struggled on in extreme poverty. At length, the fame of their sanctity brought another novice, Hugh, Dean of York, 
who endowed the community with all his wealth and thus laid the foundations of Fountain's Abbey. In 1137, Rainulf, Baron of Morpeth, was so edified by the example of the monks at Fountain's that he built them a monastery in Northumberland called Newminster, of which St. Robert became abbot. The holiness of his life, even more than his words, guided his brethren to perfection, and within the next ten years three new communities went forth from this one house to become centres of holiness in other parts. The abstinence of St. Robert in refectory alone sufficed to maintain the mortified spirit of the community. One Easter day his stomach, weakened by the fast of Lent, could take no food, and he at last consented to try to eat some bread sweetened with honey. Before it was brought, he felt this relaxation would be a dangerous example for his subjects, and sent the food untouched to the poor at the gate. The plate was received by a young man of shining countenance, who straightway disappeared. At the next meal, the plate descended empty and by itself to the abbot's place in the refectory, proving that what the saint sacrificed for his brethren had been accepted by Christ. At the moment of Robert's death in 1139, St. Godric, the hermit of Finchale, saw his soul like a globe of fire, borne up by the angels in a pathway of light, and as the gates of heaven opened before them, a voice repeated twice, Enter now, my friends. Reflection Reason and authority prove that virtue ought to be practised, but facts alone prove that it is practised, and that is why examples have more power to move our souls, and why our individual actions are of such fearful importance for others as well as for ourselves. St. Claude, Archbishop The province of eastern Burgundy received great luster from this glorious saint. He was born at Saline about the year 603, and was both the model and the oracle of the clergy at Besançon, when, upon the death of Archbishop Gervais about the year 683, he was chosen to be his successor. Fearing the obligations of that charge, he fled and hid himself, but was discovered and compelled to take it upon him. During seven years, he acquitted himself of the pastoral functions with the zeal and vigilance of an apostle, but finding then an opportunity of resigning his see, which, out of humility and love of solitude, he had always sought, he retired to the great monastery of St. Oyen, and there took the monastic habit in 690. Violence was used to oblige him soon after to accept the abbatial dignity. Such was the sanctity of his life, and his zeal in conducting his monks in the paths of evangelical perfection, that he deserved to be compared to the Antonines and Pachamiases, and his monastery to those of ancient Egypt. Manual labour, silence, prayer, reading of pious books, especially the Holy Bible, fasting, watching, humility, obedience, poverty, mortification, and the close union of their hearts with God, made up the whole occupation of these fervent servants of God, and were the rich patrimony which St. Claude left to his disciples. He died in 703. End of section 68. Section 69 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea. June 8th, St. Medard, Bishop. St. Medard, one of the most illustrious prelates of the Church of France in the 6th century, was born of a pious and noble family at Salancy, about the year 457. From his childhood he evinced the most tender compassion for the poor. On one occasion he gave his coat to a destitute blind man, and when asked why he had done so, he answered that the misery of a fellow member in Christ so affected him that he could not help giving him part of his own clothes. Being promoted to the priesthood in the thirty-third year of his life, it became a bright ornament of that sacred order. He preached the word of God with an unction which touched the hearts of the most hardened, and the influence of his example, by which he enforced the precepts which he delivered from the pulpit, seemed irresistible. In 530, Alhamer, the thirteenth bishop of that country dying, St. Medard was unanimously chosen to fill the sea, and was consecrated by St. Remigius, who had baptized King Clovis in 496, and was then exceeding old. 
our saint's new dignity did not make him abate anything of his austerities and though at that time seventy-two years old he thought himself obliged to redouble his labours though his diocese was very wide it seemed not to suffice for his zeal which could not be confined wherever he saw the opportunity of advancing the honour of god and of abolishing the remains of idolatry he overcame all obstacles and by his zealous labours and miracles the rays of the gospel dispelled the mists of idolatry throughout the whole extent of his diocese what rendered this task more difficult and perilous was the savage and fierce disposition of the ancient inhabitants of flanders who were the most barbarous of all the nations of the gauls and franks our saint having completed this great work in flanders returned to noyon where he shortly after fell sick and soon rested from his labours at an advanced age in five forty five the whole kingdom lamented his death as the loss of their common father and protector his body was buried in his own cathedral but the many miracles wrought at his tomb so moved king clotaire that he translated the precious remains to Soissons. reflection the church takes delight in styling her founder the amiable jesus and he likewise says of himself i am meek and humble of heart End of section 69section seventy of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april to june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april to june by john gilmari shea section seventy june ninth saints primus and felicianus martyrs and saint columa or columkill abbot june nine saints primus and felicianus martyrs these two martyrs were brothers and lived in rome towards the latter part of the third century for many years mutually encouraging each other in the practice of all good works they seemed to possess nothing but for the poor and often spent both nights and days with the confessors in their dungeons or at the places of their torments and execution some they encouraged to perseverance Others, who had fallen, they raised again, and they made themselves the servants of all in Christ, that all might attain to salvation through him. Though their zeal was most remarkable, they had escaped the dangers of many bloody persecutions, and were grown old in the heroic exercises of virtue, when it pleased God to crown their labours with a glorious martyrdom. The pagans raised so great an outrage against them that they were both apprehended and put in chains. They were inhumanly scourged, and then sent to a town twelve miles from Rome to be vowed chastised as avowed enemies to the gods. There they were cruelly tortured, first both together, afterwards separately. But the grace of God strengthened them, and they were at length both beheaded on the ninth of June. Reflection A soul which truly loves God regards all the things of this world as nothing. The loss of goods, the disgrace of the world, torment, sickness, and other afflictions are better to the senses but appear light to him that loves. If we cannot bear our trials with patience and silence, it is because we love God only in words. One who is slothful and lukewarm complains of everything and calls the lightest precepts hard, says Thomas Akembis. St. Columba, or Columkill, Abbot. St. Columba, the apostle of the Picts, was born of a noble family at Garton in the county of Tyrconnell, A.D. 521. From early childhood he gave himself to God. In all his labours, and there you were many, his chief thought was heaven and how he should secure the way thither. The result was that he lay on the bare floor with a stone for his pillow and fasted all the year round. Yet the sweetness of his countenance told of the holy soul's interior serenity. Though austere he was not morose, and often as he longed to die he was untiring in good works throughout his life. After he had been made abbot, his zeal offended King Dermot, and in 565 the saints departed for Scotland, where he founded a hundred religious houses and converted the Picts, who in gratitude gave him the island of Iona. There St. Columba founded his celebrated monastery, the School of Apostolic Missionaries and Martyrs, and for centuries the last resting place of saints and kings. Four years before his death, our saint had a vision of angels who told him that the day of his death had been deferred four years, in answer to the prayers of his children, 
whereat the saint wept bitterly and cried out, Woe is me that my sojourning is prolonged, for he desired above all things to reach his true home. How different is the conduct of most men who dread death above everything instead of wishing to be dissolved and to be with Christ. On the day of his peaceful death, in the seventy-seventh year of his age, surrounded in choir by his spiritual children, the ninth of June, A.D. 597, he said to his disciple, Diamit, This day is called the Sabbath, that is, the day of rest, and such will it truly be to me, for it will put an end to my labours. Then, kneeling before the altar, he received the viaticum, and sweetly slept in the Lord. His relics were carried to Down, and laid in the same shrine with the bodies of St. Patrick and St. Bridget. Reflection the thought of the world to come will always make us happy, and yet strict with ourselves in all our duties. The more perfect we become, the sooner shall we behold that for which St. Columba sighed. End of section 70section 71 of little pictorial lives of the saints volume 2 april through june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org little pictorial lives of the saints volume 2 april through june by john gilmary shea june 10th st margaret of scotland st margaret's name signifies pearl a fitting name says theodoric her confessor and her first biographer for one such as she her soul was like a precious pearl a life spent amidst the luxury of a royal court never dimmed its lustre or stole it away from him who had bought it with his blood she was the granddaughter of an english king and in ten seventy she became the bride of malcolm and reigned queen of scotland till her death in ten ninety three how did she become a saint in a position where sanctity is so difficult first she burned with zeal for the house of god she built churches and monasteries she busied herself in making vestments she could not rest till she saw the laws of god and his church observed throughout her realm next amidst a thousand cares she found time to converse with god ordering her piety with such sweetness and discretion that she won her husband to sanctity like her own he used to rise with her at night for prayer he loved to kiss the holy book she used and sometimes he would steal them away and bring them back to his wife covered with jewels lastly with virtue so great she wept constantly over her sins and begged her confessor to correct her faults st margaret did not neglect her duties in the world because she was not of it never was a better mother she spared no pains in the education of her eight children and their sanctity was the fruit of her prudence and her zeal never was a better queen she was the most trusted counsellor of her husband and she laboured for the material improvement of the country but in the midst of the world's pleasures she sighed for the better country and accepted death as a release on her deathbed she received the news that her husband and her eldest son were slain in battle she thanked god who has sent this last affliction as a penance for her sins after receiving holy viaticum she was repeating the prayer from the missal o lord jesus christ who by thy death didst give life to the world deliver me at the words deliver me says her biography she took her departure to christ the author of true liberty reflection all perfection consists in keeping a guard upon the heart wherever we are we can make a solitude in our hearts detach ourselves from the world and, and converse familiarly with god let us take saint margaret for our example and encouragement end of section seventy one section seventy two of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea. June the 11th, St. Barnabas, Apostle. We read that in the first days of the church, 
the multitude of believers had but one heart and one soul. Neither did any one say that aught of the things which he possessed was his own. Of this fervent company, one only is singled out by name, Joseph, a rich Levite from Cyprus. He, having land, sold it, and brought the price and laid it at the feet of the apostles. They now gave him a new name, Barnabas, the son of Consolation. He was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and was soon chosen for an important mission to the rapidly growing church of Antioch. Here he perceived the great work which was to be done among the Greeks, so he hastened to fetch St. Paul from his retirement at Tarsus. It was at Antioch that the two saints were called to the apostolate of the Gentiles, and hence they set out together to Cyprus and the cities of Asia Minor. Their preaching struck men with amazement, and some cried out, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men, calling Paul Mercury and Barnabas Jupiter. The saints traveled together to the council of Jerusalem, but shortly after this they parted. When Agabus prophesied a great famine, Barnabas, no longer rich, was chosen by the faithful at Antioch as most fit to bear with St. Paul their generous offerings to the church of Jerusalem. The gentle Barnabas, keeping with him John, surnamed Mark, whom St. Paul distrusted, betook himself to Cyprus, where the sacred history leaves him, and here at a later period he won his martyr's crown. Reflection St. Barnabas' life is full of suggestions to us who live in days when once more the abundant alms of the faithful are sorely needed by the whole church, from the sovereign pontiff to the poor children in our streets. End of section 72 Recording by Todd Marchand Section 73 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea. June 12, St. John of St. Fagundes. St. John was born at St. Fagundes in Spain. At an early age he held several benefices in the diocese of Burgos, till the reproaches of his conscience forced him to resign them all, except one chapel, where he said Mass daily, preached and catechized. After this he studied theology at Salamanca, and then labored for some time as a most devoted missionary priest, ultimately became a hermit of the Augustinian order in the same city there his life was marked by a singular devotion to the holy mass each night after matins he remained in prayer till the hour of celebration when he offered the adorable sacrifice with the most tender piety often enjoying the sight of jesus in glory and holding sweet colloquies with him the power of his personal holiness was seen in his preaching which produced a complete reformation in salamanca he had a special gift of reconciling differences, was enabled to put an end to the quarrels and feuds among noblemen, at that period very common and fatal. The boldness shown by St. John in reproving vice endangered his life. A powerful noble, having been corrected by the saint for oppressing his vassals, sent two assassins to slay him. The holiness of the saint's aspect, however, caused by that peace which continually reigned in his soul, struck such awe into their minds that they could not execute their purpose but humbly besought his forgiveness and the nobleman himself falling sick was brought to repentance and recovered his health by the prayers of the saint whom he had endeavoured to murder he was also most zealous in denouncing those hideous vices which are a fruitful source of strife and it was in defence of holy purity that he met his death a lady of noble birth but evil life whose companion in sin st john had converted contrived to administer a fatal poison to the saint 
after several months of terrible suffering borne with unvarying patience st john went to his reward on june eleventh fourteen seventy nine reflection all men desire peace but those alone enjoy it who like st john are completely dead to themselves and love to bear all things for christ end of section seventy three section seventy four of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june by john gilmary shea june thirteenth st antony of padua in twelve twenty one st francis held a general chapter at assisi when the others dispersed there lingered behind unknown and neglected a poor portuguese friar resolved to ask for and to refuse nothing nine months later fra antonio rose under obedience to preach to the religious assembly at forley when as the discourse proceeded the hammer of heretics the ark of the testament the eldest son of st francis stood revealed in all his sanctity learning and eloquence before his rapt and astonished brethren devoted from earliest youth to prayer and study among the canons regular ferdinand de boulogne's as his name was in the world had been stirred by the spirit and example of the first five franciscan martyrs to put on their habit and preach the faith to the moors in africa denied a martyr's palm and enfeebled by sickness at the age of twenty-seven he was taking silent but merciless revenge upon himself in the humblest offices of his community from this obscurity he was now called forth and for nine years france italy and sicily heard his voice saw his miracles and men's hearts turned to god one night when st antony was staying with a friend in the city of padua his host saw brilliant rays streaming under the door of the saint's room and on looking through the keyhole he beheld a little child of marvellous beauty standing upon a book which lay open upon the table and clinging with both arms round antony's neck with an ineffable sweetness he watched the tender caresses of the saint and his wondrous visitor at last the child vanished and fra antonio opening the door charged his friend by the love of him who he had seen to tell the vision to no man as long as he was alive suddenly in twelve thirty one our saint's brief apostolate was closed and the voices of children were heard crying along the streets of padua our father saint antony is dead the following year the church bells of lisbon rang without ringers while at rome one of its sons was inscribed among the saints of god reflection let us love to pray and labor unseen and cherish in the secret of our hearts the graces of god and the growth of our immortal souls like saint antony let us attend to this and leave the rest to god end of section seventy four section seventy five of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmarie Shea. June the 14th, St. Basil the Great. St. Basil was born in Asia Minor. Two of his brothers became bishops, and together with his mother and sister are honored as saints. He studied with great success at Athens, where he formed with St. Gregory Nazianzen the most tender friendship. He then taught oratory, but dreading the honors of the world, he gave up all and became the father of the monastic life in the East. The Arian heretics, supported by the court, were then persecuting the church, and Basil was summoned from his retirement by his bishop to give aid against them. His energy and zeal soon mitigated the disorders of the church, and his solid and eloquent words silenced the heretics. 
On the death of Eusebius, he was chosen bishop of Caesarea. His commanding character, his firmness and energy, his learning and eloquence, and not less his humility and the exceeding austerity of his life, made him a model for bishops. When St. Basil was required to admit the Arians to communion, the prefect, finding that soft words had no effect, said to him, Are you mad that you resist the will before which the world bows? Do you not dread the wrath of the emperor, nor exile, nor death? No, said Basil calmly. He who has nothing to lose need not dread loss of goods. You cannot exile me, for the whole earth is my home. As for death, it would be the greatest kindness you could bestow upon me. Torments cannot harm me. One blow would end my frail life and my sufferings together. Never, said the prefect, has anyone dared to address me thus. Perhaps, suggested Basil, you never before measured your strength with a Christian bishop. The emperor desisted from his commands. St. Basil's whole life was one of suffering. He lived amid jealousies and misunderstandings and seeming disappointments. But he sowed the seed which bore goodly fruit in the next generation and was God's instrument in beating back the Arian and other heretics in the East and restoring the spirit of discipline and fervor in the church. He died in 379 and is venerated as a doctor of the church. Reflection Fear God, says the imitation of Christ, and thou shalt have no need of being afraid of any man. End of section 75 Recording by Todd Marchand Section 76 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea. June 15th, Saints Vitus, Crescentia, and Modestus, Martyrs. Vitus was a child nobly born, who had the happiness to be instructed in the faith, and inspired with the most perfect sentiments of his religion by his Christian nurse, named Crescentia, and her faithful husband, Modestus. His father, Hylas, was extremely incensed when he discovered the child's invincible aversion to idolatry, and finding him not to be overcome by stripes and such light chastisements, he delivered him up to Valerian, the governor, who in vain tried all his arts to work him into compliance with his father's will and the emperor's edicts. He escaped out of their hands, and together with Crescentia and Modestus fled into Italy. There they met with the crown of martyrdom in Lucania, in the persecution of Diocletian. The heroic spirit of martyrdom, which we admire in St. Vitus, was owing to the early impressions of piety which he received from the lessons and examples of a virtuous nurse. Of such infinite importance is the choice of virtuous preceptors, nurses, and servants about children. Reflection. What happiness for an infant to be formed naturally to all virtue, and for the spirit of simplicity, meekness, goodness, and piety to be molded in its tender frame, such a foundation being well laid, further graces are abundantly communicated and a soul improves daily these seeds, and rises to the height of Christian virtue, often without experiencing severe conflicts of the passions. End of section 76 Section 77 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea. June 16th, 
St. John Francis Regis. St. John Francis Regis was born in Languedoc, A.D. 1597. From his tenderest years, he showed evidences of uncommon sanctity by his innocence of life, modesty, and love of prayer. At the age of eighteen, he entered the Society of Jesus. As soon as his studies were over, he gave himself entirely to the salvation of souls. The winter he spent in country missions, principally in mountainous districts, and in spite of the rigor of the weather and the ignorance and roughness of the inhabitants, he labored with such success that he gained innumerable souls to God, both from heresy and from a bad life. The summer he gave to the towns. There his time was taken up in visiting hospitals and prisons, in preaching and instructing, and in assisting all who in any way stood in need of his services. In his works of mercy, God often helped him by miracles. In November 1637, the saint set out for his second mission at Martha's. His road lay across valleys filled with snow and over mountains frozen and precipitous. In climbing one of the highest, a bush to which he was clinging gave way, and he broke his leg in the fall. By the help of his companion, he accomplished the remaining six miles, and then, instead of seeing a surgeon, insisted on being taken straight to the confessional. There, after several hours, the curate of the parish found him still seated, and when his leg was examined, the fracture was found to be miraculously healed. He was so inflamed with the love of God that he seemed to breathe, think, speak of that alone, and he offered up the holy sacrifice with such attention and fervor that those who assisted at it could not but feel something of the fire with which he burned. After twelve years of unceasing labor, he rendered his pure and innocent soul to his Creator, at the age of forty-four. Reflection. When St. John Francis was struck in the face by a sinner whom he was reproving, he replied, If you only knew me, you would give me much more than that. His meekness converted the man, and it is in that spirit that he teaches us to win souls to God. How much might we do if we could forget our own wants in remembering those of others, and put our trust in God? End of section 77section 78 of little pictorial lives of the saints volume 2 april through june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org little pictorial lives of the saints volume 2 april through june by john gilmary shea june 17th saint avitus abbot St. Avitus was a native of Orleans, and retiring into Averion, took the monastic habit, together with St. Calais and the Abbey of Manat, at that time very small, though afterward enriched by Queen Brunhalt and by St. Bonaire, Bishop of Clermont. The two saints soon after returned to Missy, a famous abbey situated a league and a half below Orleans. It was founded toward the end of the reign of Clovis I by St. Euspicius, a holy priest, honored on the 14th of June, and his nephew St. Maximin, or Mesmin, whose name this monastery, which is now of the Cistercian order, bears. Many call St. Maximin the first abbot, others St. Eusepius the first, St. Maximin the second, and St. Avitus the third. But our saint and St. Calais made not a long stay at Messi, though St. Maximin gave them a gracious reception. In quest of a closer retirement, St. Avitus, who had seceded St. Maximin, soon after resigned the abbacy and with St. Calais lived a recluse in the territory now called Donoy, on the frontiers of La Perche. Others joining them, St. Calais retired into a forest in Maine, and King Clotaire built a church and monastery for St. Avitus and his companions. This is at present a Benedictine nunnery called St. Avi of Chateaudon, and is situated on the Loire at the foot of the hill on which the town of Chateaudon is built in the diocese of Chartres. Three famous monks, Leobin, afterwards Bishop of Chartres, Euphronius and Rusticus, attended our saint to his happy death which happened about the year 530. 
his body was carried to orleans and buried with great pomp in that city end of section seventy eight section seventy nine of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june by john gilmary shea june eighteenth saints marcus and marcellianus martyrs marcus and marcellianus were twin brothers of an illustrious family in rome who had been converted to the faith in their youth and were honorably married diocletian ascending the imperial throne in two eighty four the heathens raised persecutions these martyrs were thrown into prison and condemned to be beheaded their friends obtained a respite of the execution for thirty days that they might prevail on them to worship the false gods tranquillinus and martia their afflicted heathen parents in company with their sons own wives and their little babes endeavoured to move them by the most tender entreaties and tears st sebastian an officer of the emperor's household coming to rome soon after their commitment daily visited and encouraged them the issue of the conferences was the happy conversion of the father mother and wives also of nicostratus the public register and soon after of chromatius the judge who set the saints at liberty and abdicating the magistracy, retired into the country marcus and marcellianus were hid by a christian officer of the household and his apartments in the palace but they were betrayed by an apostate and retaken fabian who had seceded chromatius condemned them to be bound to two pillars with their feet nailed to the same in this posture they remained a day and a night and on the following day were stabbed with lances reflection we know not what we are till we have been tried it costs nothing to say we love god above all things and to show the courage of martyrs at a distance from the danger but that love is sincere which has stood the proof persecution shows who is a hireling and who a true pastor says st bernard end of section seventy nine section eighty of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june by john gilmary shea june nineteenth st juliana falconiere Giuliana Falconieri was born in answer to prayer, A.D. 1270. Her father built the splendid church of the Annunziata in Florence, while her uncle, Blessed Alexius, became one of the founders of the Servite Order. Under his care, Giuliana grew up, as he said, more like an angel than a human being. Such was her modesty that she never used a mirror or gazed upon the face of a man during her whole life the mere mention of sin made her shudder and tremble and once hearing a scandal related she fell into a dead swoon her devotion to the sorrows of our lady drew her to the servants of mary and at the age of fourteen she refused an offer of marriage and received the habit from st philip benzini himself her sanctity attracted many novices for whose direction she was bidden to draw up a rule and thus with reluctance she became foundress of the Montelle. she was with her children as their servant rather than their mistress while outside her convent she led a life of apostolic charity converting sinners reconciling enemies and healing the sick by sucking with her own lips the ulcerous sores she was sometimes wrapped for whole days in ecstasy and her prayer saved the servite order when it was in danger of being suppressed she was visited in her last hour by angels in the form of white doves and jesus himself as a beautiful child crowned her with a garland of flowers she wasted away through a disease of the stomach which prevented her taking food she bore her silent agony with constant cheerfulness grieving only for the privation of holy communion 
at last when in her seventieth year she had sunk to the point of death she begged to be allowed once more to see and adore the blessed sacrament it was brought to her cell and reverently laid on a corporal which was placed over her heart at this moment she expired and the sacred host disappeared after her death the form of the host was found stamped upon her heart and the exact spot over which the blessed sacrament had been placed juliana died a d thirteen forty reflection meditate often says st paul of the cross on the sorrows of the holy mother sorrows inseparable from those of her beloved son if you seek the cross there you will find the mother and where the mother is there also is the son End of section eighty section eighty one of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june by john gilmary shea june twentieth saint silverius pope and martyr silverius was son of pope hermisdas who had been married before he entered the ministry upon the death of saint agapetus after a vacancy of forty-seven days silverius then subdeacon was chosen pope and ordained on the eighth of june five thirty six theodora the empress of justinian resolved to promote the sect of the acephali she endeavored to win Severius over to her interest and wrote to him, ordering that he should acknowledge Anthemus lawful bishop or repair in person to Constantinople and re-examine his cause on the spot. Without the least hesitation or delay, Silverius returned her a short answer by which he peremptorily gave her to understand that he neither could nor would obey her unjust demands and betray the cause of the Catholic faith the empress finding that she could expect nothing from him resolved to have him deposed virgilius archdeacon of the roman church and a man of address was then at constantinople to him the empress made her application and finding him taken by the bait of ambition promised to make him pope and to bestow on him seven hundred pieces of gold provided he would engage himself to condemn the council of chalcedon and receive to communion the three deposed theotychian patriarchs anthemus of constantinople severus of antioch and theodosius of alexandria the unhappy virgilius having assented to these conditions the empress sent him to rome charged with a letter to the general belisarius commanding him to drive out silverius and to contrive the election of virgilius to the pontificate virgilius urged the general to execute the project the more easily to carry out this project the pope was accused of corresponding with the enemy and a letter was produced which was pretended to have been written by him to the king of the goths inviting him into the city and promising to open the gates to him silverius was banished to patara in lycia the bishop of that city received the illustrious exile with all possible marks of honour and respect and thinking himself bound to undertake his defence repaired to constantinople and spoke boldly to the emperor terrifying him with the threats of the divine judgments for the expulsion of a bishop of so great a see telling him there are many kings in the world but there is only one pope over the church of the whole world it must be observed that these were the words of an oriental bishop and a clear confession of the supremacy of the roman see justinian appeared startled at the atrocity of the proceedings and gave orders that silverius should be sent back to rome but the enemies of the pope contrived to prevent it and he was intercepted on his road toward rome and carried to a desert island where he died on the twentieth of june five thirty eight and of section eighty one section eighty two of little pictorial lives of the saints volume two april through june this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea. 
june twenty first saint aloysius gonzaga saint aloysius the eldest son of ferdinand gonzaga marcus of castiglione was born on the ninth of march fifteen sixty eight the first words he pronounced were the holy names of jesus and mary when he was nine years of age he made a vow of perpetual virginity and by a special grace was ever exempted from temptations against purity he received his first communion at the hands of st charles borromeo at an early age he resolved to leave the world and in a vision was directed by our blessed lady to join the society of jesus the saint's mother rejoiced on learning his determination to become a religious but his father for three years refused his consent at length saint aloysius obtained permission to enter the novitiate on the twenty fifth of november fifteen eighty five he took his vows after two years and went through the ordinary course of philosophy and theology he was wont to say he doubted whether without penance grace would continue to make head against nature which when not afflicted and chastised tends gradually to relapse into its old state losing the habit of suffering acquired by the labor of years i am a crooked piece of iron he said and i am come into religion to be made straight by the hammer of mortification and penance during his last year of theology a malignant fever broke out in rome the saint offered himself for the service of the sick and he was accepted for the dangerous duty several of the brothers caught the fever and aloysius was of the number he was brought to the point of death but recovered only to fall however into slow fever which carried him off after three months he died repeating the holy name a little after midnight between the twentieth and twenty-first of june on the octave day of corpus christi being rather more than twenty-three years of age reflection cardinal bellarmine the saint's confessor testified that he had never mortally offended god yet he chastised his body rigorously rose at night to pray and shed many tears for his sins pray that not having followed his innocence you may yet imitate his penance End of section 82. Section 83 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Bielka. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June by Jean Gilmarie Shea. Section 83, June 22, St. Paulinus of Nola. Paulinus was of a family which boasted of a long line of senators, prefects, and consuls. He was educated with great care, and his genius and eloquence in prose and verse were the admiration of St. Jerome and St. Augustine. He had more than doubled his wealth by marriage, and was one of the foremost men of his time. Though he was the chosen friend of saints, and had a great devotion to St. Felix of Nola, he was still only a catechumen, trying to serve two masters. But God drew him to himself along the way of sorrows and trials. He received baptism, withdrew into Spain to be alone, and then, in concert with his holy wife, sold all their vast estates in various parts of the empire, distributing their proceeds so prudently that St. Jerome says East and West were filled with his alms. He was then ordained priest and retired to Nola in Campania. There he rebuilt the church of St. Felix with great magnificence and served it night and day, living a life of extreme abstinence and toil. In 409, he was chosen bishop, and, for more than thirty years, so ruled as to be conspicuous in an age blessed with many great and wise bishops. St. Gregory the Great tells us that when the Vandals of Africa had made descent on Campania, Paulinus spent all he had in relieving the distress of his people and redeeming them from slavery. At last, there came a poor widow. Her only son had been carried off 
by the son-in-law of the Vandal king. Such as I have, I give thee, said the saint to her. We will go to Africa, and I will give myself for your son. Having overborne her resistance, they went, and Paulinus was accepted in place of the widow's son, and employed as a gardener. After a time, the king found out, by divine interposition, that his son-in-law's slave was the great bishop of Nola. He, at once, set him free, granting him also the freedom of all the townsmen of Nola who were in slavery. One, who knew him well, says he was meek as Moses, priest-like as Aaron, innocent as Samuel, tender as David, wise as Solomon, apostolic as Peter, loving as John, cautious as Thomas, keen-sighted as Stephen, fervent as Apollos. He died in A.D. 431. Reflection. Go to Campania, writes St. Augustine. There, study Paulinus, that choice servant of God. With what generosity, with what still greater humility, he has flung from him the burden of this world's grandeurs to take on him the yoke of Christ and in his service. How serene and unobtrusive his life! End of section 83《Section 84 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea. June 23rd, St. Ethel Treta abbess born and brought up in the fear of god her mother and three sisters are numbered among the saints ethelreda had but one aim in life to devote herself to his service in the religious state her parents however had other views for her and in spite of her tears and prayers she was compelled to become the wife of tonbert a tributary of the mercian king she lived with him as a virgin for three years and at his death retired to the isle of eli that she might apply herself wholly to heavenly things. This happiness was but short-lived, for Egfrid, the powerful king of Northumbria, pressed his suit upon her with such eagerness that she was forced into a second marriage. Her life at his court was that of an aesthetic rather than a queen. She lived with him not as a wife, but as a sister, and observing a scrupulous regularity of discipline, devoted her time to works of mercy and love. After twelve years she retired with her husband's consent to Coldingham Abbey, which was then under the rule of St. Eba, and received the veil from the hands of St. Wilfrid. As soon as Ethelreda had left the court of her husband, he repented of having consented to her departure, and followed her, meaning to bring her back by force. She took refuge on a headland on the coast near Coldingham, and here a miracle took place, for the waters forced themselves a passage round the hill, barring the further advance of Ecfried. The saint remained in this isle in refuge for seven days, till the king, recognizing the divine will, agreed to leave her in peace. God, who by a miracle confirmed the saint's vocation, will not fail us if with a single heart we elect for him. In 672 she returned to Eli and found it there a double monastery, the nunnery she governed herself and was by her example a living rule of perfection to her sisters some time after her death in six seventy nine her body was found incorrupt and saint bede records many miracles worked by her relics reflection the soul cannot truly serve god while it is involved in the distractions and pleasures of the world ethelreda knew this and chose rather to be a servant of christ her lord than the mistress of an earthly court. Resolve in whatever state you are to live absolutely detached from the world and to separate yourself as much as possible from it. End of section 84. Section 85 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmurray Shea. June the 24th, St. John the Baptist. The birth of St. John was foretold by an angel of the Lord to his father Zachary, who was offering incense in the temple. It was the office of St. John to prepare the way for Christ. And before he was born into the world, he began to live for the incarnate God. Even in the womb, he knew the presence of Jesus and of Mary, and he leaped with joy at the glad coming of the Son of Man. In his youth, he remained hidden because he for whom he waited was hidden also. But before Christ's public life began, a divine impulse led St. John into the desert. There, with locusts for his food and haircloth on his skin, in silence and in prayer, he chastened his own soul. Then, as crowds broke in upon his solitude, he warned them to flee from the wrath to come and gave them the baptism of penance while they confessed their sins. At last there stood in the crowd one whom St. John did not know, till a voice within told him that it was his Lord. With the baptism of St. John, Christ began his penance for the sins of his people, and St. John saw the Holy Ghost descend in bodily form upon him. Then the saint's work was done. He had but to point his own disciples to the Lamb. He had but to decrease as Christ increased. He saw all men leave him and go after Christ. I told you, he said, that I am not the Christ. The friend of the bridegroom rejoiceth because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. St. John had been cast into the fortress of Machiris by a worthless tyrant whose crimes he had rebuked, and he was to remain there till he was beheaded at the will of a girl who danced before this wretched king. In this time of despair, if St. John could have known despair, some of his old disciples visited him. St. John did not speak to them of himself, but he sent them to Christ that they might see the proofs of his mission. Then the eternal truth pronounced the panegyric of the saint who had lived and breathed for him alone. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Reflection St. John was great before God because he forgot himself and lived for Jesus Christ, who is the source of all greatness. Remember that you are nothing. Your own will and your own desires can only lead to misery and sin. Therefore, sacrifice every day some one of your natural inclinations to the sacred heart of our Lord, and learn little by little to lose yourself in Him. End of section 85. Recording by Todd Marchand. Section 86 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S. Hamer. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmarie Shea. June 25th, St. Prosper of Aquitaine and St. William of Montevergine. St. Prosper was born at Aquitaine in the year 403. His works show that in his youth he had happily applied himself to all the branches both of polite and sacred learning. On account of the purity and sanctity of his manners, he is called by those of his age a holy and venerable man. Our saint does not appear to have been any more than a layman, but being of great virtue and of extraordinary talents and learning, he wrote several works in which he ably refuted the errors of heresy. 
St. Leo the Great, being chosen Pope in 440, invited St. Prosper to Rome, making him his secretary, and employed him in the most important affairs of the Church. Our saint crushed the Pelagian heresy, which began again to raise its head in that capital, and its final overthrow is said to be due to his zeal, learning, and unwearied endeavors. The date of his death is uncertain, but he was still living in 463. St. William, having lost his father and mother in his infancy, was brought up by his friends in great sentiments of piety, and at fifteen years of age, out of an earnest desire to lead a penitential life, he left Piedmont, his native country, made an austere pilgrimage to St. James's in Galicia, and afterward retired into the kingdom of Naples, where he chose for his abode a desert mountain, and lived in perpetual contemplation and the exercises of most rigorous penitential austerities. Finding himself discovered and his contemplation interrupted, he changed his habitation and settled in a place called Montevergine, situated between Nola and Benevento, in the same kingdom. But his reputation followed him, and he was obliged by two neighboring priests to permit certain fervent persons to live with him and to imitate his ascetic practices. Thus, in 1119, was laid the foundation of the religious congregation called De Montevergine. The saint died on the 25th of June, 1142. End of section 86《Section 87 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S. Hamer. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmary Shea. June 26th. Saints John and Paul, Martyrs. These two saints were both officers in the army under Julian the Apostate, and received the crown of martyrdom, probably in 362. They glorified God by a double victory. They despised the honors of the world, and triumphed over its threats and torments. They saw many wicked men prosper in their impiety, but were not dazzled by their example. They considered that worldly prosperity which attends impunity in sin is the most dreadful of all judgments, and how false and short-lived was this glittering prosperity of Julian, who in a moment fell into the pit which he himself had dug. But the martyrs, by the momentary labor of their conflict, purchased an immense weight of never-fading glory. Their torments were, by their heroic patience and invincible virtue and fidelity, a spectacle worthy of God, who looked down upon them from the throne of his glory, and held his arm stretched out to strengthen them, and to put on their heads immortal crowns in the happy moment of their victory. Reflection The saints always accounted that they had done nothing for Christ so long as they had not resisted to blood, and by pouring forth the last drop completed their sacrifice. Every action of our lives ought to spring from this fervent motive, and we should consecrate ourselves to the divine service with our whole strength. We must always bear in mind that we owe to God all that we are, and after all we can do, are unprofitable servants, and do only what we are bound to do. End of section 87 Section 88 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S. Hamer. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmary Shea. June 27th. St. Ladislas, King Ladislas I, son of Bela, King of Hungary, was born in 1041. By the pertinacious importunity of the people, he was compelled, much against his own inclination, to ascend the throne in 1080. 
he restored the good laws and discipline which st stephen had established and which seemed to have been obliterated by the confusion of the times chastity meekness gravity charity and piety were from his infancy the distinguishing parts of his character avarice and ambition were his sovereign aversion so perfectly had the maxims of the gospel extinguished in him all propensity to those base passions his life in the palace was most austere he was frugal and abstemious but most liberal to the church and the poor vanity pleasure or idle amusements had no share in his actions or time because all his moments were consecrated to the exercises of religion and the duties of his station in which he had only the divine will in view and sought only god's greater honor he watched over a strict and impartial administration of justice was generous and merciful to his enemies and vigorous in the defense of his country and the church he drove the huns out of his territories and vanquished the poles russians and tartars he was preparing to command as general-in-chief the great expedition of the christians against the saracens for the recovery of the holy land when god called him to himself on the thirtieth of june ten ninety five reflection the saints filled all their moments with good works and great actions and whilst they labored for an immortal crown the greatest share of worldly happiness of which this life is capable fell in their way without being even looked for by them in their afflictions themselves virtue afforded them the most solid comfort pointed out the remedy and converted their tribulations into the greatest advantages end of section 88 Section 89 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S. Hamer. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April to June, by John Gilmarie Shea. June twenty eighth, Saint Irenaeus, Bishop, Martyr. This saint was born about the year one hundred twenty. He was a Grecian, probably a native of Lesser Asia. His parents, who were Christians, placed him under the care of the great Saint Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna. It was in so holy a school that he learned that sacred science which rendered him afterward a great ornament of the Church and the terror of her enemies st polycarp cultivated his rising genius and formed his mind to piety by precepts and example and the zealous scholar was careful to reap all the advantages which were offered him by the happiness of such a master such was his veneration for his tutor's sanctity that he observed every action and whatever he saw in that holy man the better to copy his example and learn his spirit he listened to his instructions with an insatiable ardor and so deeply did he engrave them on his heart that the impressions remained most lively even to his old age. In order to confute the heresies of his age, this father made himself acquainted with the most absurd conceits of their philosophers, by which means he was qualified to trace up every error to its sources and set it in its full light. St. Polycarp sent St. Irenaeus into Gaul, in company with some priest, he was himself ordained priest of the Church of Lyon by St. Pothinus. St. Pothinus, having glorified God by his happy death, in the year 177 our saint was chosen the second bishop of Lyon. By his preaching he in a short time converted almost that whole country to the faith. He wrote several works against heresy, and at last, with many others, suffered martyrdom about the year 202 under the Emperor Severus at Lyon. Reflection Fathers and mothers, and heads of families, spiritual and temporal, should bear in mind that inferiors will not be corrected by words alone, but that example is likewise needful. End of section 89
Section 90 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmarie Shea. June the 29th, St. Peter, Apostle. Peter was of Bethsaida in Galilee, and as he was fishing on the lake was called by our Lord to be one of his apostles. He was poor and unlearned, but candid, eager, and loving. In his heart, first of all, grew up the conviction, and from his lips came the confession, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so our Lord chose him and fitted him to be the rock of his church his vicar on earth, the head and prince of his apostles, the center and very principle of the church's oneness, the source of all spiritual powers, and the unerring teacher of his truth. All scripture is alive with him, but after Pentecost he stands out in the full grandeur of his office. He fills the vacant apostolic throne, admits the Jews by thousands into the fold, opens it to the Gentiles in the person of Cornelius, founds and for a time rules the church at Antioch, and sends Mark to found that of Alexandria. Ten years after the ascension he went to Rome, the center of the majestic Roman Empire, where were gathered the glories and the wealth of the earth and all the powers of evil. There he established his chair, and for twenty-five years labored with St. Paul in building up the great Roman church. He was crucified by order of Nero and buried on the Vatican Hill. He wrote two epistles and suggested and approved the Gospel of St. Mark. Two hundred and sixty years after St. Peter's martyrdom came the open triumph of the church. Pope St. Sylvester, with bishops and clergy and the whole body of the faithful, went through Rome in procession to the Vatican Hill, singing the praises of God till the seven hills rang again. The first Christian emperor, laying aside his diadem and his robes of state, began to dig the foundations of St. Peter's Church. And now on the site of that old church stands the noblest temple ever raised by man. Beneath a towering canopy lie the great apostles, in death as in life undivided, and there is the chair of St. Peter. All around rest the martyrs of Christ, popes, saints, doctors from east and west, and high over all the words, Thou art Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. It is the threshold of the apostles and the center of the world. Reflection Peter still lives on in his successors, and rules and feeds the flock committed to him. The reality of our devotion to him is the surest test of the purity of our faith. End of section 90. Recording by Todd Marchand. Section 91 of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2. April through June. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea. June 30th, St. Paul. St. Paul was born at Tarsus of Jewish parents and studied at Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel. While still a young man, he held the clothes of those who stoned the proto-martyr Stephen, and in his restless zeal he pressed on to Damascus, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of Christ. But near Damascus a light from heaven struck him to the earth. He heard a voice which said, Why persecutest thou me? He saw the form of him who had been crucified for his sins, and then for three days he saw nothing more. He awoke from his trance another man, a new creature in Jesus Christ. He left Damascus for a long retreat to Arabia, 
and then at the call of god he carried the gospel to the uttermost limits of the world and for years he lived and labored with no thought but the thought of christ crucified no desire but to spend and be spent for him he became the apostle of the gentiles whom he had been taught to hate and wished himself anathema for his own countrymen who sought his life perils by land and sea could not damp his courage nor toil and suffering and age dull the tenderness of his heart at last he gave blood for blood in his youth he had imbibed the false zeal of the pharisees at jerusalem the holy city of the former dispensation with st peter he consecrated rome our holy city by his martyrdom and poured into his church all his doctrine with all his blood he left fourteen epistles which have been a fountainhead of the church's doctrine the consolation and delight of her greatest saints his interior life so far as words can tell it lies open before us in these divine writings the life of one who has died forever to himself and risen again in jesus christ in what says st john chrysostom in what did this blessed one gain an advantage over the other apostles how comes it that he lives in all men's mouths throughout the world is it not through the virtue of his epistles nor will his work cease while the race of man continues even now like a most chivalrous knight he stands in our midst and takes captive every thought to the obedience of christ reflection st paul complains that all seek the things which are their own and not the things which are christ's see if these words apply to you and resolve to give yourself without reserve to god and a section ninety one End of Little Pictorial Lives of the Saints, Volume 2, April through June, by John Gilmary Shea.